not starting early, are we? No. You can use with 
Okay. Okay. I was curious if you were like a media group or something. She's attached to the Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Otero County, New Mexico, Spacing Meeting Agenda, Monday, May 9th, 6 p.m. I have a roll call, please. Commissioner Marquardt? Here. Commissioner Matherly? Here. Commissioner Griffin? Here. All right, at this time, uh, I'd like to make a, uh, a motion for approval of the agenda. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Can I get a second? I'll second that. I'll second. Oh, I'm sorry. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, at this time, what I'll do is open this discussion. This is going to be the first item on the deal, or, or the only item, is discuss the 2020 election audit findings. Uh, at this time, I'll let our attorney, uh, Mr. Nichols, kind of bring us up to date on what the county is, and then we'll go to this discussion to wherever, wherever else. Okay? And, and if I may, um, I'd like to say that I appreciate everybody for showing up tonight. Um, there's been a lot of hard work that's gone in behind this audit. Um, and we appreciate every single one of you for, for knocking on the doors um, and for uh, just looking deeper into our electorate and the claims if it was hacked or if it wasn't hacked. Um, but, but there was a tremendous amount of work that went into it and I want to uh, thank each of you for that and I would also like to say that you know that as as Gerald said that, that Roy's going to mention where the county's been where we're at David um, we can't wait to hear what you what y'all have to share this evening um, and we'll give a, a short time for comment too if anybody wants to sign up there's a sign up sheet up here in the front um, at the end if you want to to uh, to address the commission but Again, there, I just like to say there's no action items that are going to be taken tonight. Um, the commission board is just like y'all. We're just citizens, and we just want to hear um, what what has been um, uncovered through this audit. So, thank you. Great. Um, so, I'm going to comment on uh, the status of our contract with Echo Mail and. Uh, Result, the results they produced. Um, so the county in January contracted with Echo Mail to conduct a forensic audit of the 2020 election. Um, that process started and um, there was a, a lot of controversy. Uh, Congress um, weighed in somewhat. The House Oversight Committee sent letters to Dr. Shiva of Echo Mail and um, Based on that, um, I believe he made a determination, or Echo Mel made a determination that they didn't want to be involved in some of the controversy and um, the political nature of the issues, essentially. And uh, on March 17th, they sent us um, the limited results of the limited analysis they had conducted thus far since uh, beginning the process. and. Um, we had to come to an agreement over how much that was worth, what uh, we had paid them half of the contract. The contract was just under 50000 We'd paid half of that um, sometime in February. Uh, we didn't believe that um, the work uh, the Echo Mail had um, produced um, was covered by the half that we had already paid uh, after talking to them. Uh, we were able to get a refund of, uh, I believe, 15125 um, So we spent uh, just under 10000 on the work that they did do for us. Uh, and in that work, um, I'm probably going to misstate this, but they conducted an analysis of, of basically looking at the machine results and comparing that to, to one of the other, the not the ballots processed, but um, I'm sure Aaron or David will, will say correctly exactly what they did. 
but it was a very limited analysis um, that did not have the ballots that we scanned uh, or the ballots that um, the Clements and their organization scanned as, as part of this, this process. Um, so based on the very limited analysis they did, they made it clear that they did not see any fraud, that the numbers added up on that. But that is not to say that um, there isn't fraud or issues. Uh, we don't know because that was, again, a very limited analysis. Um, I believe uh, the county does not have any further contractual uh, relationships with Echo Mail or any contract for further audit to occur. But I believe that um, the Clements and their organization um, are continuing an independent analysis of uh, the 2020 election um, because they are concerned citizens and um, as everyone else here wants to know whether there were issues. Um, so they're taking on that role and um, going to be reporting it to the county. Um, I believe some findings tonight and I believe there's others uh, that they'll still have um, based on ongoing um, analysis and process but from my point that perspective that is what I know and what I can report on uh, as of today and um, for for Thursday's meeting um, if anyone curious the agenda suite has our uh, settlement from um, with echo mail posted and it has the analysis that they provided posted, uh, if anyone wants to look at that. Well, is that something different than what we have in our book now, or is that? No, it should be what you have in your book, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, David, at this time, if you would like to give us a briefing on your findings? I would, and, and I would like to propose, we've got other cameras there, sir, that are uh, you might be blocking, so just please be be mindful. Um, yeah, I, what I would propose to do is just tell you what I'd like to communicate tonight and uh, introduce some folks that will assist us. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, um, my name is David Clements. I'm a former business law professor and longtime prosecutor, both in Otero County and in Lincoln County. And my expertise, if I had to make a claim, is in the presentation of evidence, something that I've done, I'm very comfortable with. And um, like many in the country, after November 3rd, 2020, uh, we were given a narrative about this being the most safe and secure election in history. And um, the people don't seem to agree with that sentiment. And we've looked at Rasmussen polls from back in early 2021 Less than half the country felt that way, but over time, as more and more information has trickled through, in spite of the fact that mainstream media does not cover these issues, in spite of the fact that there's a good chance that your YouTube stream might freeze up because of what we're talking about tonight, that's the type of censorship that we're dealing with, um, over 60%, according to Rasmussen, of the country believes that the election was substantially <coughs> compromised. 85% um, of Republicans feel that way, and more alarming, more than 40% of Democrats also feel the same. So this is a bipartisan issue. I personally am not even a registered Republican. I'm an independent, and I'm looking at this because I care about the rule of law. I'm here because of a greater power, and that is this. In the scriptures, we are told that the Lord abhors inaccurate weights and measures. He's disgusted by inaccuracies. And what we're finding is inaccuracy after inaccuracy after inaccuracy and a pile of red flags. Just recently, the documentary 2000 Mules has put out conclusive proof of geospatial um, data, video from particular states and counties dealing with uh, mules that are stuffing the ballot boxes. And there's actual GPS coordinates and it looks to be election outcome determinative. That's not what we're going to discuss here. But this problem not only is not going away, in light of the millions of people that have likely already watched that documentary, you're going to be hearing more about it. And I would encourage you to watch it. I've watched it twice, and it's going to have a bearing on New Mexico because they're going to release uh, information pertaining to these nonprofits 
that are um, basically collecting ballots and disseminating them to be, be trafficked. So that's happening. Um, my concern, because of what we're going to share with you tonight, is this. You have a potential crime scene in Otero County. Under the law, in particular, NMSA 1-12-69, the state has the obligation legally to preserve all election records for 22 months. Likewise, you also have to follow the law with respect to the federal uh, landscape because there's a full faith and credit operation between state and federal law, which also requires preservation of any election or ballot that has a presidential race, a Senate race, which our election in 2020 had. 22 months, and if you fail to uh, preserve those records, you're facing up to a year in jail, not you in particular, but uh, anyone that, that breaches that public trust, and up to a $1,000 fine. There are other statutes that you all have to be aware of right now based on what we're going to share with you, which includes uh, election code in New Mexico 1-5-23, unlawful destruction or alteration of data recording media, voter files, file maintenance list, voter registration system software and instructions, or voter list. And there's a penalty for that if you don't preserve this type of records, and it's a fourth degree felony. Um, so. I want to plant the seed with you about those particular laws because they're going to come into play and you're going to have to make a decision. The sheriff that's present is going to have to make a decision. Your district attorney is going to have to make a decision. And we're not here to condemn. We want to first applaud you all for opening the door to us to look at what happened. And we want to applaud the clerk's office who has actually worked with us in great degree when we did ballot imaging and scans of 25,000 ballots, 6,000 envelopes. Um, we worked together and got things done. And it was because of the county clerk who opened the door to Jeff. Um, we, we feel confident about your clerk's integrity. But we found something that's truly alarming. And we need to have that discussion. That's the purpose of this meeting tonight. Uh, to convey what we found, I'm going to introduce to you um, a subject matter expert <coughs> by the name of Jeff Lindbergh. Many folks are familiar with Jeff Lindbergh's work in Antrim County, Michigan. Um, out of 20 expert reports that are attached to pending litigation there that's still ongoing, 10 of those reports are authored by Mr. Lenberg. In fact, the second meeting presentation that we provided to you all, we showed a seven-minute clip where Mr. Lenberg demonstrated something that we were all told couldn't happen, that you couldn't hook up machines to the Internet, that you couldn't switch ballots or votes. And Mr. Lenberg proceeded to show every one of those things in real time with the existing software that was on Dominion and EMS, uh, uh, ES&S machines. He is present and he's been working behind the scenes with us for a reason. And the reason um, is self-evident after you've heard from your attorney, uh, Mr. Nichols. And I, and I have to bring this up because this is the type of scrutiny and intimidation that we've been under and I have to give voice to this. Dr. Shiva does exemplary work. This was a very modest audit contract comparative to what you're seeing in Maricopa County of 10 to 11 million dollars that was cost that, that was the cost here we're looking at fifty thousand dollars which is still a lot of money um, as soon as dr. Shiva was identified as the prime contractor in this audit we had a manufactured incident of a political operative that put up a selectively edited video claiming she was intimidated we went before this commission and uh, it appeared that you agreed with our um, recitation of the facts and we didn't issue a letter on any findings that there was intimidation going on from your constituents that have canvassed door to door. Um, in fact, you've got wonderful canvassers here that are law abiding and many of them are in the room here right now. But based on that manufactured encounter that did not occur, not the way that it was presented, the Daily Beast wrote a propaganda article and the U.S. Congressional Oversight Committee used that article to assert jurisdiction that they never had to meddle into an audit in Otero County from Washington, D.C. And through the use of lawfare, Echo Mail had to retain counsel. I can only guess what the going rates are for uh, legal rates in Massachusetts, but you're looking at $300 to $500 an hour 
within weeks the contract value of fifty thousand dollars would be obliterated so it was something where congress was was weaponized against your constituents and what's here so you've got a lot of volunteers here though that we kept under the radar that have the same expertise and, and in many respects greater expertise than dr shiva on what we're going to talk about tonight and one such expert is mr lenberg i'm going to establish his qualifications just for this record and then i'm going to turn it over to him and afterwards what i would uh, ask to do is have aaron give you an update on some of the other issues and then conclude with recommendations to you all uh, knowing that you aren't uh, necessarily going to uh, have any actual items tonight but there's much to ponder much to consider okay um, so uh, mr lenberg who is to my left holds a uh, bachelor of science degree uh, and a master's of science degree uh, 1979 1980 he's been at this for a while in electrical engineering from 1980 to 2011 he was a staff member at sandia national labs in albuquerque new mexico from 1980 to 1992 his expertise covered satellite systems design development testing and support for dsp satellite payloads from 1992 to 1995, he was on, on assignment at the Department of Energy, or is it environment? Is it energy? Department of energy? Department of Energy headquarters in Washington, D.C., overseeing the interconnection of six national laboratories, secure network for export controls. Also, Mr. Lemberg was responsible for overseeing the creation of a secure way for the 28 nation nuclear suppliers group to communicate information about export control concerns. So we're, we're talking about nation state vulnerabilities, including nuclear capabilities 1994 to 1996 um, involvement with um, investigation of elections going back to 1994 so he has monitored elections not just since 2020 but since 1994 and up until today uh, he was a distinguished member of technical staff with the national labs working on the area of national level vulnerability assessments and he's held the highest level of clearances with national security he's retired since then doesn't hold them now but at one point we trusted our greatest secrets to mr lindbergh lindbergh um, and he also has a, um, a person that many of us are familiar with as one of his supervisors and that would be sid gutierrez who is a hall of famer uh, most people know who he is um, and his pedigree but mr lindbergh um, could use him as a reference if you'd like to hear from him. Uh, so with that introduction i'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to mr lindbergh to tell you um, some of his findings tonight thank you do we need that one also or no uh, thank you for the introduction um, unlike david um, i'm not comfortable <laughs> uh, giving evidence uh, but i'll do the best i can here uh, i'm just here basically for the same reason that has been said which is uh, I, I, I want the truth uh, to be known, period. I just want to let people know what I've seen, what I've heard, and I will be absolutely as truth, truthful as I can uh, about that. Um, and so uh, to do that, I need to, um, uh, you know, correct a thing or two. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will say in, in the, the time he was talking about there, my, my history, uh, early on at Sandia, I... I spent a lot of time doing satellite systems and uh, developing test systems for those. And so I became a real expert in testing equipment, hardware, software, and so on. So that's part of what's qualified me to do what I'm doing now, as well as developing remote monitoring systems. Our satellites were 20,000 miles out in space, and of course you can't go out there, so you have to be able to do the command and control and get the data back and so on. So, uh, so that I did. And then uh, while in Washington, uh, it was a side project, it wasn't part of my job, but I got sucked into, uh, I guess God keeps doing these things to me, but I, I got sucked into the 1994 gubernatorial race in the state of Maryland. So um, it was kind of like what happened in 2020. A uh, late night switch of votes occurred, it looked fishy, uh, the candidate ran an investigation, had a thousand volunteers, but only had one computer person. After a couple months, a very good friend of the candidate uh, uh, got me involved. 
and as a result uh, I got a very quick training on how to uh, you know look at uh, databases uh, voter history rolls as well as election results and all that kind of stuff and do analysis I was trained by a real expert in that area uh, and after that um, their uh, Long story, I ended up going to the FBI. They ended up opening an investigation, and I ended up being uh, the support for them. I thought they'd have their own, own data processing guys. They didn't. So I ended up doing data processing for them and providing answers to data questions that they were asking uh, for their investigation. So that was in 1995. Now, the correction is I haven't done any election stuff in between there, okay? <laughs> so uh, I, I haven't been you know, involved in election integrity investigations uh, until recently. That occurred in August of uh, 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 2020 when I got involved. But before I go into that, I want to talk a little bit more about the third phase of my work at Sandia, which was vulnerability assessments. And as he mentioned, uh, what, what we really did there in that last 16, 16 or 17 years was uh, we were asked as a group, um, really, we had some would say the best capability in the country to look at the vulnerabilities of high value systems in US systems. And uh, we did it as black hatters. We didn't do it as white hatters. So what that means is we were looking for one way in and then we would almost always have to demonstrate that. Whether it be physical security, computers, networks, vaults, nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. you name it, we did it and we had teams that worked on it sometimes small teams sometimes very large teams uh, sometimes short projects sometimes very long projects but in any case we were assessing this against a, a nation state threat so i'm very familiar with other nation state capabilities and i'm very familiar with our own capabilities okay let's just say as as well as probably anybody in the country our team uh, there was uh, as aware of the capabilities of, of other countries, okay? And that's what we were concerned about, is what could they do to us? Uh, what I will say uh, at this point is that based on that background, um, it's my own uh, expert opinion that the highest priority as a bad guy, some other nation state, we won't name, the nation states, but the highest priority, in my opinion, because I put on my black hat, I act like I'm them, would be to subvert our election system. Okay? The reason is you can take over a country without firing a shot. Absolutely. If you can decide who the leaders are, if you can put judges, if you can answer constitutional questions any which way you want over a period of time, you're not going to do it in one election. It's going to take a bunch of elections but you can take over a country. And that would have been my top priority, okay? Nuke weapons would be a, a very close uh, second, but the top one would be elections. And I have no doubt that our adversaries have thought of this, <laughs> okay? Um, that they are uh, doing everything in their power to be able to uh, influence our elections. We've known that, that's been in the press. They do it with propaganda, they do it many other ways. But look, guys, they're going to do it, you know, with our election system as well, any which way they can. So that's my area. That's what I'm concerned about. And I think uh, uh, related to that is this concern that many people in the country think something went wrong with the election. It seems to me the right thing to do is ask the questions, get them answered, so we can get confidence in our election system. What I see happening instead is if you bring up the question, uh, if you even question election integrity, then you get canceled, you get shut down, you get lawfare, you get all kinds of things coming at you. And some of you probably have seen the DHS bulletin uh, of February 2022, which literally says what I just said, but it's from the U.S. government, which says that if you are an individual or a small group, you are the highest threat to the U.S. homeland if you uh, make false narratives, in other words, narratives that disagree with what the government says the narrative is, having to do with specifically, in that bulletin it says, election integrity and COVID-related stuff. But number one is election integrity, okay? 
So that's one reason why I'd rather not be sitting here. Because according to that definition, there will be people saying, you know, I fit that. <laughs> and I'd, I'd rather not be a target of, of anybody. Uh, but that's what our government apparently is doing right now. And you all have heard about the, the Department of, uh, what's the, the uh, Misinfor Misinformation uh, <laughs> Guidance Bureau or whatever that they recently created. Um, so that, that's a concern. Yeah. Uh, but what I want to do is, is tell you a little bit more related to the qualifications having to do with the last couple years. So uh, before the last election, it became, because of my 1994 experience, it was very heavy on my heart that this election was critical. Um, I normally don't pay a whole lot of attention. I go and vote like everybody else does. But this one, uh, I got involved in looking at it early in August of 2020. Um, and doing vulnerability assessment. And I, I can tell you at the time, I assumed that the equipment, the machines, were 100% good. I as assumed that they were secure, mm -hmm. and my thoughts were not about that at all. I was looking at vulnerabilities of processes, how you could mess with voter registrations, how you could uh, mess around with early voting, how you could you know run ballots twice, all that kind of stuff. Um, but over time, uh, my thoughts have shifted considerably based on my experiences over the last uh, couple years. So from August uh, through about October of 2021, I worked essentially full time on this. And I did it at my own expense. So no one has paid me uh, for any of my labor. They've covered in some cases some expenses, but uh, I've paid in probably $60,000 out of my own pocket as well as giving up a $200,000 uh, contract uh, work that I had to be able to, to do this. So um, just thought that was important to know. There is no entity out there paying me to say what I'm saying, sure. okay? Right, so. um, I just wanna tell you what I've seen, what I've found. In that time frame, I spent time in multiple states. I've been in Georgia. I've been in multiple counties in Georgia. I've talked to multiple county clerks. Uh, I have data from multiple counties there. Uh, I've been in Michigan. I spent months in Michigan as an expert witness on the interim case. We were provided uh, equipment, uh, tabulators of a couple different types to do analysis on. We had EMS equipment, um, not the actual hardware, but we had the software, and we were able to do actual testing. So we were actually able to run tabulators, run ballots, uh, program compact flashcards. Uh, we uh, we probably, our team became uh, some of the most experienced election people in the country, having run hundreds of elections, uh, programming hundreds of elections, and then executing on those. So um, that's where those expert reports came from, was working with a team of people over several months to get that done. So uh, that's, I'm, I'm speaking from actually being involved and in seeing the software, uh, and if you get a chance to read those, uh, those expert reports around the web, you can go uh, see those, those are public records, okay? Um, now, based on all of that, uh, I was back here. Um, I got a call about this Otero uh, uh, upcoming uh, audit and uh, the Clements needed a little help. And so I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll come on board to help set up to do the scanning. And so I proceeded to do that, set up a process. Um, and I really wanna thank the county team I think they did a great job. Uh, we worked really well together to get that done in a timely fashion. I think it went very well. And I really wanna thank them for the additional time that they spent with me, allowing me to kind of look over the shoulder and look at some ad additional stuff. Based on my experience, uh, I said, look, I don't wanna touch your equipment, but can I be allowed to have you look at some things on your election management system? So we did that, uh, we did that a week or so ago, I think, something like that, week and a half. But um, when we did that, I was surprised to find some things that should have been there that were not there. So uh, in, in particular, if you, if you run the RTR, which is the results tally and reporting system, um, in that system, uh, the county uh, personnel was able to show me that the image files had been downloaded uh, because it's recorded in there. Okay, so it shows a check mark, they had been downloaded. But the image files weren't on the system. Now, just really quick, Jeff, when you're referring to image files, 
are we ballot image ballot image are we talking about a particular election 2020 oh. okay yeah so, so we were in looking at the project file for 2020 and uh, the uh, the personnel had downloaded the images but the image files were not in the system okay they weren't there and uh, that is non-trivial to delete image files from a whole bunch of different subdirectories and so on uh, that should have been there along with that there are other records that get downloaded when you load in the results and those were not there um, the cast vote records per tabulator were not there there was one massive ca uh, cast vote record for the entire election um, so there were things that I was looking for that weren't there uh, then they happened to tell me that um, that the voting machine company had come in in February to upgrade the system and to uh, remove some of the older files mm -hmm. and um, that they had asked them to do a backup ahead of time of some of the information if they didn't want to lose it um, if I can just comment about that I, it seems to me that that couple things wrong with that <laughs> one is that uh, you know if, if you're going to come in and do an upgrade it's your responsibility absolutely. to do the backup, not, absolutely. not call someone else and say you do a backup. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so it would have been their responsibility to see that it was done and, and not uh, rely on someone else to have done it ahead of time. Um, so, so that's an issue. Why they had to clean off old files is another problem. In the process, we looked for, because the results were missing, what I said is, look, let's just go get the project file and hopefully there was a backup done in the project file and then that'll have the results in it and you can load that and then we'll see those image files we'll be able to get the stuff that's missing but we could not find the project file on the system so then uh, discovered there had been a backup made of the project files for a whole list of elections okay like six elections or something like that and so um, said sure let's let's pull that out let's take a look at the backup so they pulled it out uh, looked at the backup and went through each of those f folders and in each one it had a project file and it had a security file okay associated with that project file for like a half a dozen elections except for 2020 the 2020 election file was not there uh -huh. the security file for it was but the project file was not there hmm. Now, the personnel I was talking to said, you know, I, I, I must have deleted it. And I'm looking at it going, I don't think so. Based on, you know, the fact she was able to copy everything else over correctly, I don't understand how she would accidentally go in and delete one it file. It had to have been selectively deleted if it was deleted. That's what it looks like to me. My expert opinion was someone deleted that. Yep. Okay, that file. I, it should be there. It's not there. Okay. And again not making accusations but the voting machine folks did come in in February and I don't know when the audit process started okay and, I, and just for purposes of, of the live stream and for you all here uh, the the voting machine vendor in New Mexico is Dominion and the authorization for the full forensic audit was in mid-January so not only mm. was there an authorization for us to evaluate these very things to, for it to be a full forensic audit, wasn't just paper ballots, it was the election management system, which is what we're talking about today. People from Dominion, the Secretary of State's office, the Attorney General's office, all knew that this full forensic audit was underway for about a month at that point, because we began canvassing almost immediately, because that was one of the things that we could do without having uh, obstacles presented in our way on having access and so um, that's the timeline so we have knowledge and there's only a few people that have an opportunity to have access my understanding is that the election management system is within the the clerk's office um, I don't want to provide details on exactly where but we know exactly where that system is and it stands to reason that the only people that should have any access to it would be clerk personnel or approved vendors and in that case that would be people from Dominion. 
Yeah, I, I want to. I wanted to add to that, but go ahead. About the date. They actually did come to the maintenance until June twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth of twenty twenty one. So I was wrong. Because remember, I think I told you I didn't remember if it was this maintenance or the maintenance. Okay. So, the, so you think they've only been in the office um, that one time Correct. since twenty twenty. Okay. Uh, so they definitely had the possibility of erasing stuff. I know you were concerned that maybe you had accidentally erased stuff. I still feel like I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm looking at it and I just don't see how you could have selectively uh, done that. That's not easy to do. And uh, I, I want to raise one question from a time, time standpoint. If you'll recall, in June, July of the uh, 2021 20, time frame, that was when there was great promotion for the Mike Lindell Cyber Symposium, where delegations were going over all across the country to show up to see about, to look at vulnerabilities in the machines. Uh, around that time frame, I don't have the specific dates, we know that backups were uh, created by Tina Peters, who's a county clerk in Mesa County, Colorado. And we started getting information across the country of Dominion reps going in under the guise of this trusted build maintenance and they were wiping records. So whether it's June, July or February, we're getting more information right now as we're here. The fact of the matter is under 1-12-69, those records by law have to be preserved. And now we've got people that are questioning themselves, talking up to a mistake. And I want to caution you all to not blame yourselves because that was the knee-jerk reaction Dominion in Michigan. They wanted to convince the clerk staff that they must have done something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when we're talking about county liability, this is very, very important uh, to, to listen to Mr. Lemberg's expert opinion. We'll be quiet. I, I got one question while we're on this right here, just so I can understand. Each one of the mach machines, did you have to go through each and every machine that the county has or that's responsible for? or do you get online and it talks to all of them at once? How, how do you get in and do your backup file on your project file? How did you lose it? It's it's every on machine? On a server. It's not on the machine. Server. One machine. On so all these machines are hooked up to one machine? Server. No, it has nothing to do with the machine. Yeah, we're just yeah. talking about the election management it's system, the which is a single computer in the county clerk's office. Okay. So it's not so, on the... No, not the tabulators. So the terminology is tabulators, okay, and those are the things, you know, out in your various uh, locations where, where the voting occurs. And then the EMS is the election management system, which you take the compact flashcard, which has the results on it, and you load those into the election management system for all of your, from your tabulators, okay? And so then it accumulates all those results, and then the county clerk can audit that and, and, and do the, the proper reporting out of those results. But all of those records uh, should be maintained, should, should be available on, on that election management system. Now, now, one thing that he mentioned was the preservation of compact flashcards, right? Yeah. And, and uh, if you can instruct the county commission on whether those have been preserved uh, with respect to November 3rd, 2020. I, I believe they've told us they really only have one set and so for every election you reuse those which means that they are not preserved and that will be one of our recommendations even though they're a little expensive and I've by talked, law it's not required yeah. after yeah. the 45 days yeah i would recommend it though uh, because of the fact that uh, there's information on those cards that can be extremely helpful in doing any kind of audit in the future if there's any question um, related to this i'll just mention um, that uh, and, and the ladies can probably answer this, 2020 was the first time that the images were actually downloaded off the cards. So apparently they've been captured, you know, on the cards, but they were somehow instructed or told not to download those onto the machine. In a similar way, there is a log file, it's called an slog.txt file, that is generated automatically on the tabulator, it's on the compact flash card. Those should be downloaded also. So in Antrim, I have the slog.txt files. In Maricopa, I have the slog.txt files. In Georgia, I have the slog.txt files. These give in the file every action that occurred on that tabulator, exactly when it was opened, 
you know, who opened it, uh, the, and so on. It's got all of the information there. When it was closed, if it's re-zeroed, the LAT testing is there. You know, literally ballot by ballot, there's, there's an entry in, in this log file. So if there's something weird occurring, this log file is very important because it has a very accurate date and time stamp when that occurred. So for example, the log file would show that two o'clock in the morning, there were some more ballots possibly added to the machine if you had the log file. I'm just saying not here, but I'm saying in some case, if you had some fraud going on, it would actually give a record of the date and time that that ballot was run through the system. And we did see this in some places where very late night, they were still running ballots through the system after a long stop. It's not like they ran out of, um, uh, I, like they were backed up, uh, you know, and, and just taking them that long to get ballots. Big, big gap, and then they, they uh, ran more ballots uh, late night. So not here. I'm talking about other locations, other states where that occurred. So the, the thing I'd like to go to on this is, though, my concern is because of what I've learned in some of these other states is that there's the potential that the machine that's in the county has remote access capability, okay? So um, why am I concerned about that? I'm concerned about that because on more than one occasion, the voting machine manufacturers have led people to believe that they have no connection like that. And yet, those connections absolutely exist. In fact, there's a four minute video. If we can run that four minute video. This four, it's the shorter one, MP4, and it's the shorter one. Let me see, I can't read the names from here. Yeah, that's it. Sound? In northern <coughs> Michigan, where hearings have been held back and forth regarding the results this of the 2020 election, and from November 3rd on, the eyes no, of many in the nation were yeah, focused on voting Please. regularities in Antrim County, Michigan. The plaintiff in the court case, Bailey v. Antrim County, Michigan, filed a response to the county and Secretary of State's motion for a protective order. The Secretary of State and county did not want information about the election available to the public. In plaintiff's response, he included forensic reports conducted on the machines in Antrim County. The expert's claims are quite shocking and starkly contrast the narrative that we have heard. Dominion's own website claims the voting machines are not designed to be connected to the internet. Here is that screenshot. The website states, voting systems are, by design, meant to be used as closed systems that are not networked, meaning not connected to the internet. It is technologically impossible to real time and or flip them. The media claimed for months that the machines were not connected to the internet, but according to the forensic report, that is incorrect. The experts examined both Dominion and ESNS machines, and both were connected to the internet using wireless technology. This is a fact that machine vendors knew well before the election because their proposal for a for a pitch included information about internet transmission and wireless capabilities. The claims that machines were never connected to the internet is odd, considering the companies specifically contracted for it. Some of the forensic evidence for this fact includes the wireless chip made by the company Talit. This is a picture from the forensic audit of the chip inserted into the machine to transmit information wirelessly. Here's a picture from one of the emails from a Dominion representative stating, modem transmissions this election, the 2020 primaries, were terrible in some areas. Failures and timing out due to the weaker 3G signal and cellular network issues meant that some of your precincts weren't able to transmit but instead brought the cards in to tally. We turned off image saving, which will improve transmission by a few seconds. This is a clear admission that they knew the machines were connected to the internet and that there were problems, so they had to tally manually. Dominion representatives were communicating with election officials to fix modems and working to improve connectivity speed. 
The media's claim that the machines were never connected to the internet appears to be a cover-up of a verifiable truth. The fact that they stopped saving the images of the ballots is improper without express authorization from the Secretary of State or the state legislature. Election evidence must be maintained for any potential audits. Deleting the scanned images is improper. The media also claimed that there was no foreign involvement, but according to the forensic report, that is not true. The 4G card included in the ESNS machines, pictured here, was made by the company Talit. The project to manufacture the chips, according to the report, was funded by the Chinese and has ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Here's a picture of the press release from Talit announcing Yuzhen Yang as a member of its board of directors, which states that he is the CEO of China Fusion Capital. He is a very wealthy Chinese businessman associated with the Chinese Communist Party. What rationale did Talit use to include him on their board of directors? This tape here is a receipt showing the information getting transmitted over the 4G network. Michigan uses the Dominion Voting System's ICX model. The forensic exam found the machines communicated with two IP addresses. One is registered to the Ministry of Education computer located in Taipei, Taiwan. The second IP address is registered to a company in Nuremberg, Germany. The Dominion model ICX appears to be manufactured in Taiwan and shipped to the United States via China Airlines. This is a picture of the box with the tracking labels. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. By the way, I want to make it very clear. I'm not suggesting that, that you guys had modems in your tabulators. Uh, but what I want to point out with that is the CEO actually testified before the Senate that they had no connections. And yet, it's verifiable in the emails and so on that, that they had connections. So uh, that, with that in my mind, I'm sitting here going, yes, they're telling folks here there is no connection. Um, so I looked into a little bit more of, of what was going on um, with this specific equipment, the, the model that, that you guys have. And um, what I discovered was that there are features inside this particular Dell model um, that can be used for remote access uh, capabilities. Uh, there are there are six USB ports. Two of them allow for waking up the computer with various things that occur on those two ports. And um, and and there's actually six ports in use on the EMS here in Otero County. And uh, something I haven't been able to do, but would like to be able to do with the appropriate authority is to find out a little bit more about what those are connected to. Um, the reason is two, those two ports can wake up the machine when you don't expect it to, and it can be woken up because of specific technology that's in this machine um, where it doesn't turn on the screen. So the computer's there, it's off doing things, and you don't know because the screen's not on, okay? So that capability is available in the equipment that's sitting here in the county. And secondly is on the motherboard of this uh, Dell, and I'm not saying it's there, but the concern is it might be there, is a, uh, a, a socket designed for a wireless modem to be plugged in on the motherboard, okay, not on an add-in card. And it specifically has an Intel te technology called AMT which allows for out-of-band administration of the, of the computer. What that means by out-of-band is the operating system doesn't even know that you're on the computer and you're changing things. The idea is if the Windows is busted, a remote administrator can come in, fix some drivers, and make the machine work again without actually having to come from a distance away, which is a great feature if you're our, your IT guy, uh, guy and I were talking about it. It's a great feature if you're administ administrating computer spread all over the place. On the other hand, it should never be in an election system, period. Mm -hmm. My opinion, modems should never be <coughs> in an election system, and, um, and you should never have this kind of capability uh, where you can wirelessly connect and, and go in and modify the system. So uh, the concern is, is it in there or not? I have no idea. But if it is in there, 
then with this ability, it can wake up the machine. It doesn't give any indication that it's awake. Um, you can do it with a wireless connection. You could be parked along the curb, you know, outside the office there, and you could make modifications to this machine, you know, as, as much as you wanted to, and no one would know that you're doing that. And so that would be my concern, is that there could be, especially given that video where they say, we don't have it, but they had it. The other reason I'm concerned about it is I want to tell you a quick story about Georgia. So in my time in Georgia, uh, it was county clerk, Coffee County, okay, and uh, she, on the runoff, uh, they sent down uh, to be with her a couple Dominion representatives. One of them was from Detroit. Why they had to send people from out of state, I don't know. But um, she is actually the one that had a viral video that showed how you could just change the votes on the on the high-speed scanner. You could adjudicate and change any vote on any ballot you wanted to, and that went viral on the internet. Uh, that was prior to the runoff. And then for the runoff, they sent these guys down. Her high-speed scanner, she had one, was misbehaving very badly. She was having trouble getting 20 ballots through it. She just, she, it was driving her crazy. So finally, her uh, supervisor, uh, she's the election supervisor, but the board, uh, the head of the board, mm -hmm called up uh, Dominion and said, you know, you need to fix this uh, or, or we're going to have to let everybody know how bad your equipment is. And so uh, about a half hour later, um, the Dominion guys came in and said, Misty, try one more time. Try just one more time. And she was skeptical. Uh, she, by the way, did not allow them anywhere near the equipment. So they did not, they weren't allowed to touch it, go near it. It was locked in a separate room. So they did not access that equipment, but that machine ran perfectly after that. And I can verify because yeah. I showed up later and she demonstrated it for me that it was running perfectly. Yeah. Okay, so they somehow, the, the common sense conclusion would be they accessed her machine <coughs> remotely and changed the configuration and fixed it. And those machines were advertised <coughs> as absolutely having no wireless capability, no connection to the outside world. And their desktop EMS was connected to their high-speed scanner through a bridge, and I believe it's the same model that's sitting in the county here, okay? So that's why me as a black hatter, I'm going, this question needs to be answered. <laughs> Is there something inside this machine? Because optionally, it could have that capability to be connected. Uh, wirelessly and and therefore and that appears to be what they did in Coffee County okay so that that's the concern that uh, that I had there and, and why uh, I wanted to bring that up and I think someone needs to look at it and, and I want to just add a little bit more clarity for folks when we talk about the, the representations from Dominion not only did he make those representations he was under oath when he made them to the Michigan State Legislature he lied under oath he committed perjury and you had people, not only uh, experts that actually had access to the motherboard and confirmed that you had the ability to, to hook these machines to the internet. You had Eric Coomer, the vice president of Dominion, admit as much, he's been recorded, and I provided those videos uh, some months back, where that was a feature that was touted a as a vendor to these places. Um, so that, that's important. And the other thing that I'll, I'll mention is this. Um, I had just gone to Idaho, and I've listened to the vice president of ESNS voting. It's not Dominion. But I, I want to just provide this analogy for you right now, because a lot of times the automatic knee-jerk reaction is, even though we're giving you conclusive proof of the lack of preservation of critical election records related to November 3rd, 2020, that if we bring up Michigan or we bring up Georgia, everyone's knee-jerk instinct, well, that's not here. And that's absurd. That's like, let's say that you have a bank that you open up in, uh, we'll call it the Dominion Bank. And I was a member of the Dominion Bank in Georgia. And somehow someone breached that, that vault and money was taken that affected me. I moved to New Mexico, don't have a whole lot of banking options. And here we are with the same type uh, Dominion Bank, same vault, because we're using the same computers here. It's not an excuse for people to say that this happened someplace else. This requires investigation. And right now we've got 
a crime scene. I'm calling it like it is. It's a crime scene. And all we're doing is giving these people opportunities to continue to move the ball and communicate with people that should not be touching these machines. These machines are absolutely vulnerable. Um, Jeff, if, if there's any other things that you want to yeah, recommendations. So um, well, before recommendations, so a couple things. Uh, first of all, on that, uh, the modems, I, I want to emphasize the uh, vulnerability of that. They connect to uh, through their cell phone modems, and they create uh, a, a virtual network with a listener in the county, okay? You don't officially have a listener. They call it a listener, but it's really two-way. But here's the problem. It goes through something called an APN, okay? And that APN, if you have the credentials for that, you can connect to that equipment from anywhere in the world, okay? Anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So when I go to Africa, I have a small company down there, um, I take an unlocked cell phone down there. I buy a $2 SIM card, I plug it in, I put in the Safaricom APN name and, and password, and boom, I can talk to anybody that has a Safaricom network anywhere in the world, okay, by just putting in that APN name and the password for it, which is on the internet, okay. Now these passwords are not on, but my question would be, who holds the keys? Yeah. The counties don't. Yeah. Who holds the keys? Who knows what the, those credentials are for that? Okay. It's a reasonable question that the people should know. They should know. Who holds Absolutely. the keys and how well secured are they? You bet. Who might have stole the keys Okay, uh, to that? Because if you steal the keys, you can have access to any equipment that has that cell modem in it. You can be on. Okay. So huge vulnerability. Now, moving back to the county, um, the ladies uh, were very nice to invite me to the logic and accuracy testing. And they did a great job explaining what they were doing, uh, test ballots, the whole thing. And uh, the one thing I learned brand new there that I did not realize is that the way the ADA unit works is that uh, you do the vote with the ADA unit. ADA for is stands for? For the uh, American Disabilities Act. What's the actual equipment called? I forget. ATI. ATI is the equipment, yeah. But it's, it's for, you know, disabled people to be able to vote. Um, and the ballot uh, then gets fed into the tabulator. And it's fed into the same slot, correct? Selena, it's fed into the same slot. And it actually votes the ballot. And it reverses it. So you can check to see that it voted correctly. And I took a picture of one of these. And on there, it looks like it was hand filled in. It's not computer generated. You know, computer generated is a perfect oval filled in. Yeah. Instead, it, it in their software, they've, for some reason, purposely made it so that it doesn't look like it was computer generated. Okay, then you turn around and you feed that ballot back in and now it tabulates that ballot. I have a huge problem with that. Having a tabulator that can modify a vote. Okay, now in this case it's great. I, I mean, I don't have a problem with people with disabilities voting. I want them to be able to vote, okay? I want to do everything possible sure. to make it easy for them to vote. Sure. But not with this mechanism. A tabulator should never, ever be able to vote a ballot, okay? And these tabulators that you're using today can, okay? That's a problem, and here's why. If you, everything's in this, I'm not saying it's occurring, I'm saying as a bad guy, I love it, because all I gotta do is change the logic slightly, and I put in a voted ballot, and I see, I, sorry, I see that, didn't mean to wake you up, Robin. I, I see that uh, uh, the, the machine sees that I didn't vote on some down ballot race. So it votes for me. It reverses the ballot. And what do we do when it reverses? We just feed it back in. Now, what I need to tell you, because of my travels, that we saw something very unusual occurring across the country that is out of spec in Georgia 
the reversal rate on the tabulators was between 15 and 20 percent. And I said, what did you do? Well, we just feed it a second time and then it takes it. Sometimes we have to feed it a third time and it takes it. But it always takes it. So you've got to stop and say, well, what's going on here? Why is the tabulator reversing the ballot in the first place and then it takes it on the second or third try? Are you talking about when they're using the ATI for it? No. So are you talking about if it's undervoted? A normal ballot. No, no indication, no undervote, no problem. It reverses the ballot. It just reverses it, not because of undervote. Okay, well, we've never had it like that. Okay. When it reverses it, any time yeah. we've had elections, it's because it was completely it, no vote or it was overvoted. It, it can reverse it and tell you on the little screen, or in your case, the big screen, that it was undervoted or uh, overvoted right. or things that it's programmed that's to reverse for and give you an opportunity to fix it. Uh, that's true. It can do that. But what I'm talking about is reversals not due to that, okay, because it's in the S-Log file. We saw reversals in Michigan and Antrim County averaging about 30 percent and had one of the townships that was 86 percent. Which okay. township was that? I don't Do remember. You remember? Um, was that Antrim? Or? That was Antrim. That was Antrim County. And, and just a reminder, we showed the seven-minute video in one of our second um, presentations. And in Antrim County, that was the one where there was 6,000 votes, 6,000 that were flipped. It was 7,000. 7,000. I'm sorry. 7,000 votes that were flipped. And uh, Mr. Lenberg was the expert in, in the analysis that was done with that particular uh, machine. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, my concern is this capability, uh, whether these are reversing here or not, can be used technically, I believe, to do that. To look at a ballot that's been voted, find races that weren't voted, then vote for you. Okay? And it might not even have to reverse it. I, I'd have to look at the actual, you know, uh, printer and, and see where it is. And I don't know if it can print it and take it at the same time. It may have to print it and reverse it like it does for the ATI. Uh, I'm not sure. But this raises huge questions in my mind that need to be investigated, okay? Why is that feature in there? Now, if you've looked at any of my expert reports, you'll find another one that is quite astounding as far as features that don't belong in a voting machine. The ability exists in these voting machines to go down about six menus down in the, in the utility menus and change the date and time. I demonstrated in one of the expert reports in Michigan that I could generate four different tapes with four different results with the exact same date and time stamps of the open poll, election day, the closing, the printout within a couple seconds, okay? So basically, there's this capability to generate a new tape after the fact. And there's no indication that it's a reprint, that it's not the original from election night, okay? That should never be allowed in a voting machine. That feature should not be there, okay? And, and you know why? Because how do we do the canvas? We don't go count the ballots, typically. What we do is we take the paper tapes, you which are signed by all the poll workers right. when the polls are closed so you right. have everybody's signature on each one of them. Right. Yeah, you put so those... If they were duplicated, you'd have to get everybody's signature again. Yeah, that's assuming that someone, uh, that, that it's a county that pays that kind of detail, like you guys do, pays that kind of attention. Believe it or not, there's some counties that may not be doing that in our state. I have some of those records that are missing the signatures, okay? So you're doing it correctly, but there are other counties that are not, all right? So having that ability to go back and print a tape where you can make the <coughs> answer come out different than election night, but it looks like it's an election night tape, that should never be in a voting machine, okay, in my opinion. It's, it's just way too vulnerable because a bad party could go back in and, and, and mess with it. Okay. And th this bears mentioning, we do share um, responsibilities with Doniana County because of Chaparral. 
and so I'm not speaking for Mr. Lindbergh on whether or not their practices are as good, but this impacts races involving Rick Little. Uh, in the past, you've got congressional races, which obviously that's a, that's an issue. And most recently, the Gateway Pundit put out an article um, based on some of our audit findings where you had uh, lack of chain of custody and drop boxes that were just stuffed to the gills. So I'm not saying that's related to what Mr. Lemberg's saying, but we have to take a look at our neighboring counties, especially when we share candidates that are up for vote. A uh, couple other vulnerabilities I'd like to mention real quick because it is on your system. I found the same thing in Antrim, Maricopa, and here now, and that is on your EMS, there is Microsoft uh, SQL Server Management Suite 17. And uh, uh, they, I, I, I told them where to go look for it. They pulled it up on a menu, ran it, were, and clicked it to go into it. There was no password required. First of all, this tool is not from what I can tell from the certified Dominion equipment by Pro V and V, that it is not on the list of certified software to be on the machine, okay? Um, but it was on the machine in all three of these locations. What this tool allows you to do is anything you want to the data. In fact, there's a well-known little trick where you go in and you change the password and now you go back out and you just created your own password into the system. You don't need to know the Dominion password anymore. You can do all the Dominion functions uh, on, on the system. And I actually proved, proved that, that we could do that, not in Otero, but in other locations, okay? So this is like having, you know, uh, a secure system where you have, you know, big locked door, you've got a big gate out front, you know, you got some guards, and then you walk around the back of the house, and not only is the door open, there's no back wall. You literally can do anything you want on the system, okay? And it's a database-based system, which means that everything is kind of in this database. The results are in there, the programming's in there, everything is in the database. And you have full capability to modify it any which way you want. I actually demonstrated that in my seven-minute vid seven video. I went in and used that tool to modify and make what we call the Antrim shuffle occur, okay? We could modify it and do that, okay? Well, um, one of the things that I, that I wanna bring up with, uh, with what Jeff's mentioning is, um, again, when we look at these vulnerabilities and you're seeing what's going on in Antrim, you've got the expert reports, you've got the video evidence, and um, these vulnerabilities, this is about public trust. The reason why we came to you back in October with that 261 page report, because is that there, there's a lack of, of trust. And so many people in the audience, and I can already uh, anticipate the knee jerk reaction once again is, well, you don't know if that's happening here. We want to have a look under the hood to confirm or dispel that, uh, that, that suspicion. And what have we been told? We've been told that the taxpayers of Otero County don't own your machines, that the Secretary of State does, as if our taxpayer money didn't go to them. And they've threatened us. They've threatened us that if we touch these machines, they will decommission them, you're on the hook for them, and then they'll just replace them with something else, courtesy of the taxpayer. And also criminal charges. That I, I, was, I received a letter from the Secretary of State that said that she was going to turn this over to the attorney general and the attorney general would prosecute me under electorate laws so 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 that's the so for the folks that want to condemn us for not being able to have that conclusive <coughs> proof it's because we're getting threats from up high and what i want to leave you with uh if, if just not because we're gonna have to hear from aaron as well is that ultimately it's your clerk and your county commission that has to certify this when you certify something you're saying you're vouching for it that this is a trust worthy process and it, it appears that we're being held at gunpoint you have to use these machines or else you can't look under the hood or else trust us and even without any help we're demonstrating massive vulnerabilities at every level and we're not done yet we're going to keep giving you guys 
updates and details with experts of Mr. Lenberg's qualifications going forward. And, and we have to be careful again because of the lawfare that's being deployed by Congress and a bunch of um, operatives that are hell bent on stopping our inquiry. So I want to mention it's not for lack of trying. We'd like to have access to everything um, that's consistent with the resolution that we entered into to partner together. And, uh, and we'd like to have that access, um, but it's going to require a decision from you all. Are you going to listen to your constituents based on public trust? Or do we just take our, our talking points from Dominion, the very people that likely wiped your election file from 2020? Um, any, anything else, Mr. Lindbergh? Not, not at this time. Okay, at, at this point, I'd ask for Aaron to, to join us and give um, an update on some of the other aspects that you need to be aware of. I, I would like to say one last thing before you move the mic, and I want to make it very clear. I really do appreciate the county staff and all the cooperation, and I don't want what I'm saying here to be uh, construed as me accusing them of anything. Sure. Because I don't think there's any issue. I think your team is uh, very has very good processes. They yes, talked to me quite a bit about those, and they they knew a lot uh, of detail, and, and it sounded very good to me what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I want to commend them, but because you're doing this, it gives an opportunity to answer some difficult questions that need to be answered, not covered up. If the American people are going to begin to trust the system again, we got to get some of the answers. we got to get to the bottom line and not just say, well, you guys are criminals if you look at the if you look at the election equipment, which is what they're trying to do not just here but in other locations as well. Absolutely. So one more quick question for you: If we have a split county, one Anna, and like you talked about, I'm going to go to work. You have like the uh, representative down there. So how is our machines? How how do they talk to each other? How do they work? Where it's strictly. Otero, and you turn in what it is, it's strictly Donna Anna, and they turn in. That's correct. One that, that's correct, right, Robin? Right, and we have They're several independent. other um, senators and representatives that share other counties as well. We're, yeah. That's not yeah. the only one. Yeah, the machines are not hooked together. Okay. The results, you just send them in some way to the Secretary of State or state level, and they get accumulated there, right, right. for those races that go across the boundaries. So there's no electronic connection that I know of. Uh, or needed between uh, the, the counties. I'd just like to briefly give you all an update on where we're at with the audit. Um, obviously, we expect it to be done by now, but we didn't expect our prime contractor to be railroaded out of um, his contract that he had. So if you could go to the next slide, please. I just want to go over a quick list. Um, we have reorganized the team. Um, with competent people that will be able to do everything that Dr. Shiva did with the possible exception of the signature matching analysis um, because he has that signature matching software that we aren't able to recreate at this time. But we, we do have software now to re recount the ballots, to match images to images. Um, and we're looking at quite a lot of things there. Um, I do need a few additional records from you all because it turns out that the ballots that we have did include some of those hand tallied ballots. Um, at least by the numbers, it seems like it must have. So for us to tie it back to something, I'm going to have to have them all. And I know we've had discussions about how to do that and maintain voter privacy, so we're just going to have to figure out a way to do it so that we're able to tie down our numbers. Finally, that's one of the reasons I, I'm not able to talk about that quite yet. Um, the um, enthusiasm for what you all are doing here in Otero has spread throughout the state. At, by the end of the month, we will have scanned ballots in eight counties. Um, awesome. <laughs> Good and since we have our own software, we'll be able to do all that analysis, you know, without paying anybody tens of thousands of dollars. So I think that's a good development for the Absolutely. state. And then additional groups have become active. Um, across in other counties that I'm not even directing or involved in. So I think this um, enthusiasm for getting to the bottom of it, it's definitely not going away. And there's, you know, thousands of people now across the state that are going to see this through, you know, in all counties, Absolutely. not just this one. Um, 2,000 Mules, as you know, came out last week. It supports um, very much so the theories that we've set forth in October, our October 2021 report. 
um, which shows massive anomalies in the absentee ballots in every single county in the state. And 2,000 mules um, certainly um, accounts for part of that, that, that method of stuffing drop boxes. Um, and I want you to remember, um, before I go into what I want to talk about today, that those drop boxes were funded by uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his Center for Tech and Civic Life, which is a non-government organization, and that's going to come up a lot, those NGOs. So um, since we don't have the final full results of all of the aspects of the election to talk about today, I just want to kind of do some high-level discussion of some things that we figured out recently. If you could go to the next slide, please. In this room, you have uh, most of our wonderful canvassers, um, and I'm so thankful for the work that they put in. This, this pie chart right here represents thousands of hours of work um, on their, their part, and I'm very grateful. Um, we, at the end of the canvas, we canvassed every weekend for about two months, and we were able to sample 20% of the households in Otero County, which is a huge sample size. Um, with that sample size, you can um, have confidence that these numbers that I'm showing you right here mm -hmm. are accurate within 2% of themselves. So when I say there's 4% ghost votes, within 2% of 4%, I mean, we're pretty sure that's that's just true across the county. Um, it, and certainly in the, um, we, we canvas full precincts so that we would have an accurate picture of full precincts. And I'll get into this. Um, we're going to drill down. It's going to take a long time to really get everything out of the canvas that I can explain to you, but I just want to keep it high level for today. So from the canvas, 59% <coughs> of the households that we knocked on the door, there was no issue with those registrations at the door, but 40%, 41% had issue. And, and I think this is a really big deal. 30% um, of the people we knocked on the doors, they don't live at that address. Some of them, they never lived at, th at that address. Some of them, there was no record of them ever existing at that address and they need to be removed. 40% um, of that 30% also voted. So there's no way for us now at this point, you know, unless that we can confirm, no, this person never lived here. I know that for a fact. Um, those ones, we can't say whether or not those votes were valid or not because they're not there to ask and the people that live there now don't know. But so there's, there's just a giant unknown, I would say, with that 30%. But um, the thing with the other slices of the pie, the incorrectly recorded uh, were 5%. Um, and that means that we went to the door and we said, how did you cast your ballot in 2020? Did you cast it absentee? Did you cast it in person on election day? Did you cast it early? And they would say, almost, when, this, when it was wrong, it was almost, I voted on election day. But it was recorded as early or absentee. And whenever that happened, we would say, you know, are you sure because this is what the Secretary of State's record says. And sometimes they say, no, you're right, I'm not quite sure, it could have been early or whatever. But these people that I'm saying, this 5%, they're like, no, I know it was, I voted on election day and it was recorded as something else. And then the ghost votes account for 4% of the doors we knocked on and those were, um, it could be two things, it could be, uh, a vote was cast from a name, a person at an address that absolutely didn't live there, or somebody knows that they did not cast a vote, and a vote was cast in their name. So we had, say, a couple that um, they said, it, the record showed they voted absentee. I think that's what, what it was. But he was like, no, we were in the hospital with COVID throughout early voting, and we never voted in November 2020. But a vote was cast in their name. That's a ghost vote. And then we have 2% votes dropped, and that's where somebody says, I know I voted, and there's no record of their vote in the record anymore. And so um, this 11%, this speaks to manipulation of the digital record. So this speaks to, and sure, there's going to be some error. Sure, there's going to be some people that just misremember, though we did our best to make, make sure that people weren't misremembering and that they would, they would vouch for themselves that, no, this is what I'm saying. And just so people know, um, when we lock, look at the law of large numbers and scientific methods of polling, the reason why you can't chalk this up to a bunch of people that have lost their minds in Otero County that don't remember how they voted <laughs> Thank you. is because of the law of large numbers. That's why you have a sample size of 20%. Usually what happens is you see variability for a point in time until you reach a sufficient large enough number and you see normalization <coughs> in the canvases that were done here 
these numbers did not change from week to week, and they more or less stayed the same, which shows a percent control. It normalizes. So uh, we use the same uh, methods that you would have for any high-level polling place, but we've outsampled them by leaps and bounds. And so just like if someone surveyed on the phone on who they're going to vote for, we accept those polling methods. We put them on the news. But for whatever reason, when we describe that here, we get eye rolls from certain people. And it's, it's quite frustrating that we understand how these laws work. And I just want to let you know that if people want to chalk this up to memory issues, it's disrespectful to your voters. They know who they voted for in the most consequential election that we've had in recent memory. Yeah, we weren't asking who anyone voted for. We just asked, how did you count your ballot? Just to make sure, because we were accused of doing things like that. Um, so the 30% is problematic because the voter rolls are out of date, very much so. The 11%, those three slices, the brightly colored ones, those speak to manipulation in the digital record. And we had warned that there was manipulation in the digital record in our October report. If you could go to the next slide, please. I'll just rehearse this or re review this real quick. Um, this is your daily registrations in Otero County according to the Secretary of State's um, voter rolls. And what I've done here is I've just pulled out the number of people that registered each day going back to April 2016 up through July of 2021. <coughs> so that's what the x-axis is. And then the numbers of people who registered each day is on the y-axis. So you can see um, it just looks like a bunch of squiggles, but you can kind of see where the registration, where registrations were being injected um, in large numbers. Um, there was massive amounts of registrations being injected throughout 2020. You can see there's kind of a blank space underneath the squiggles there surrounding the election. That means that registrations were so massive, there were like even, there was even Sundays, there were massive numbers of people being registered on Sundays, um, which typically um, doesn't happen. So I also added a couple of arrows here of things we've learned recently. Um, New Mexico joined what's called ERIC um, there in 2016 and ERIC is the Electronic Registration Information Center and we pay this ERIC which is a private company started by a <coughs> private lawyer who has ties to Mr. Soros um, and we pay him large sums of money to we give ERIC our databases uh, the MVD databases and other databases, and then they theoretically compare these databases to other states to see if people are showing up in more than one state, and then they'll send the state a report, oh, these people might be duplicated um, for Arizona or Colorado or whatever, and I've, I've asked for these reports. The answer is you can't get them. Um, Eric is a private company, and, and maybe there's uh, privacy issues, and I said, well, redact all the names and let me see the reports. Well, I haven't gotten them, have gotten nothing. Um, and then in 2018, two things happened. Um, it appears that our Secretary of State gave an organization called Rock the Vote, which we'll talk about again later, backdoor access to our rules. And then also MVD was given right access to our rules. So that means not only can clerks add people to the roles and the Secretary of State add people to the roles, the MVD can also do it. Before that, it, it had to go through the clerk or the Secretary of State, and now they can directly. But it still does. If yes, you're supposed to approve it. Everything goes through our office. They can't just put it in. It has to come to us first to process it. But you're processing massive numbers coming from MVD is the point, right? Um, occasionally, yes. Yes, okay. After elections, when our books reopen, we do. We okay. have a lot. Okay, well, there's massive massive changes in the roles if you go to the next so that those are some concerning things um, I also didn't talk about this but they're supposed to she just mentioned the books close the books are supposed to close surrounding an election so at the start of early voting until the canvas is complete there should be blank days in this record there's no blank days in any of our counties um, so the the polls were never closed well the deal is is we stop accepting aff um, affidavits okay mm -hmm. But if we have some that still need to be processed or that were mailed to the Secretary of State's office and then they got to us, they were within the time frame. So we can't not process that. Right. Also, in New Mexico, we have same-day voter registration. Now we do. That's new, though. Yeah. yeah. So no, that it, No, it's been going on. It's been going on, but it, it was mandatory 
that we had to do it on in 2021 some counties mm -hmm. already did it no I know I think it started in 2020 but so for 2016 2017 2018 oh, okay. they should have been closed there should have been no registrations yeah, happening they had to be continued to process well you have to get the people in that met the deadline but there's absolutely no change uh, here's an election day there's no change it's still the same little pattern and I'll, I'll zoom in on a little bit more and show you is in what what should have been some blank days so that's concerning enough just looking at one county but when you can compare counties to counties let's put Otero next to Bernalillo County Bernalillo has the opposite political persuasion majority um, they're quite a bit bigger but they have the exact same shape so all counties are being having these shapes these injections into them just scaled for population if you could go to the next slide and again I've showed you this before but you can do four at a time you can do all 33 counties at a time next slide and they'll all have the same shape okay so that's something is going on there there's some access to the digital record that doesn't appear to be kosher next slide please okay so it gets worse when you zoom in and you can actually see what those squiggles look like they have this weekly cycle that repeat themselves um, and this this contains I believe some that should have been blank because there would have been a primary right there at the end of that and it's not blank it just actually increases um, so the thing that's concerning about this is I've broken out these registrations by parties so you have Democrat Republican decline to state um, <coughs> what seems to be and this is statewide right now it's just um, e but it doesn't matter if you look at it by county or by state it's the same thing even down to precinct it looks like this actually um, so you have decline to states approximately matching the minority party and then the Democrats uh, always manage to out out register on and all the days so this should not happen if this was random these lines would cross each other um, sometimes Democrats would do better sometimes Republicans would do better but it turns out that um, no matter what day you look at in the record Democrats always um, out register Republicans I actually have seen some I've done this same analysis in some other states and I've seen what a random state looks like and the lines cross each other sometimes there's a blank day for a particular party that doesn't happen in New Mexico <coughs> so if you could go to the next slide just quickly here's uh, have you ever Aaron have you ever looked at like different events where there was a lot of voters that were signed up on say yeah. one particular day because I think of one day in Española where we did a, a rally mm -hmm. and we we registered 52 I think we switched 52 over yes from Democrat to Republican yes and I just wonder if if There's, that's ever looked into I mean I've looked through the whole record for Doniana County and I know that the Republican Party say tables at the county fair and I know they register a lot of people and there's no month there's no month in the last 10 years where Republicans um, out registered Democrats and, and the way it stays so consistent as far as it's just like the 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 registration on the Democrat side stays just the same amount ahead yes yes and we have different events that drive mm -hmm. different voting blocks right. to go register right. more at different so they times should if switch the Republicans mess sometimes. up yeah. you, you should have a spike in Democrat registrants and if the Democrats mess up and right. one other quick thing whenever we process any voter registrations our system generates voter cards and they're mailed out to the voters mm -hmm. so if people are getting them that shouldn't be that weren't making changes or weren't registering then they would probably you know give us a call and say what's going on here so what we're processing so I'm not sure I, I don't know exactly where you got these, but I'm not sure how it's accurate a, these it's are. It's the Secretary of State's own data. I pulled out the just the dates with the party uh -huh. out of her thing, those those columns, and I've plotted them. That's all it says. Mm -hmm. and, and the people that you're registering might not be on this right here. It I might mean, be this. Like, there might sure be. Who does this and how accurate And I is. think things are happening. being counted. Yours or this? Well, ours are, we're on a statewide voter registration system. So everybody that's registered and vote in Otero County, we have them under Otero County, but every other county does as well. Okay. They I there's a comment from Mr. Lemon. Yes, sir. No, I was just going to say, if, if um, there is a registration that's, that's put in there, and I know you guys ver do some verification on Social Security number, see if it's already in there, and address, make sure the address is correct. But if it's one of these where it goes to a person that's not there but 
they have a real social security number. This is what Eric does actually. It sends stuff right. back that's verified and, and even says, oh, these people are not registered to vote. Right. If and they we know that. Right. are flagged and mailed um, notices for that and we have to contact and find out which one it should be. Right. Us or the other state. Right. Putting on my black hat, mm -hmm. you could use that mechanism since they have all the data to send something back that says, here's a bunch of people that will look real in your state. Okay, and the system could register them. You would send a card out to them, it would never come back because it just goes to some place and gets thrown away. But it would be returned if it's a, I know like at the post office, they know who basically lives there and then they return the mail if people have moved. But if someone gets it, if I get a, a thing misdelivered to my house, mm -hmm. I don't give it to the post office, I throw it away. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why would I take the I, time I to give it to the post office? It's seven and a half miles away. I have a yes, mail carrier for uh -huh. seven years. Uh -huh. I know my customers. They chuck them. They just don't know they? Yes. They, they, they yell at you about, why did you give me this? It doesn't belong here. Nobody's lived here at this address with this name, uh -huh. and they threw them away. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't give them back to me? No. Well, I know for a while with my yeah. address, because I've lived there forever, and when my mom went into a nursing home, her things started coming to me. Well, they were being returned because she was not at my address. She was not on my address. So the postman asked me, I keep getting things here, and I'm having to return them because she doesn't live here. And I said, yes, she does live here. But when you get bed departments mm -hmm. where people are in and out and in and out, and I'm sorry to say, you have some apartments where there's 15 people living in that apartment and you ask, do they belong here? Oh, yes, they belong here. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to deliver that mail. Mm -hmm. If they throw it away, there's nothing the postal person can do about it unless they have proof that that person didn't live there. But then they should have been delivering it. We want to get through this as quickly as possible. And, and yes, sir. Yeah. Good point. And I guess really what I'm suggesting suggesting Robin is that there's things going on that you don't know about because I think you'd notice if this was coming through your office and it was always imperfect every Tuesday I get seven Democrat registrations you know no, for months I know you don't but it this is what it looks like in the database yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure how accurate that is. well it's her own it's her own stuff the raw data without the graph? yeah I do uh-huh well I can't put it out I'll get arrested but I have the raw data <laughs> So you got it from her? Yes, from the Secretary of State. Okay, mm -hmm. move debate. on, please. Okay, so I want to get into um, the corruption that I believe we can uh, say with confidence is occurring at the Secretary of State level, and I have evidence um, to back that up. Um, I just want to introduce you to three people before I get into this. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but there's Maggie Tulis Oliver, our Secretary of State. She was a former Democrat operative, so she was a former employee at some of these NGOs um, that are currently under scrutiny for their association with the ballot trafficking mules. And then Alex Curtis is the uh, communications director. He's also a former Democrat operative um, associated with some of these people that you're going to... Uh, I think it's quite interesting. And then Catherine Clark, um, she, during the 2020 election, she was a, ca a candidate for the county clerk in Santa Fe County. Um, she was a current Democrat operative at the time. She owned a, com a company that ran, um, they made field plans for candidates, for Democrat candidates, and she was a current Democrat official. She was an elected official in the Santa Fe County Democrat Party. Next. So that Alex Curtis gentleman here is some of the NGOs he's been associated with. The one I want to point out right now is the Center for Civic Policy. Um, he was working there at the same time that the Center for Civic Policy was assisting Rock the Vote to get that backdoor access to our voter rolls. And I'm just going to go over that real quick. Next, next slide. So these are the emails that we got through an IPA request. It, is, um, it starts off with Jen Latino um, of Rock the Vote sending the Secretary of State a request to have 
access to her OVR system that's the same as they have in Pennsylvania and Virginia. And if you go to their website, they actually explain what that is, and it uh, appears that they have right access to the roles in Pennsylvania. Um, and um, it, it was proven in Pennsylvania that they actually had IP addresses were pinging their, their database. Next. And Maggie says, oh, we'll reach out back to you. And then um, this Meli Melanie Aranda starts to assist Rock the Vote. She's a center in civic policy and continuing to ask the Secretary of State, you know, we need this access. Can you give it to us? Is it ready yet? And then the Secretary of State says, I will give you a call shortly so we can discuss what is available to you that should meet your needs. So they take this um, conversation out of writing and onto the phone, which I would do too if I was aware of IPRA and I was about to give a third party enhanced access that other people don't have um, to the voter registration rolls. Next slide, please. So just to remind you, Rock the Vote shares their OVR platform with 1,198 other partners. We have no idea who these partners are. We, we have an idea of who one of these partners are, and that's going to come up shortly. Next slide, please. So here's Rock the Vote um, associated with Center for Tech and Civic Life. And you've probably heard Center for Tech and Civic Life um, is the organization that Mark Zuckerberg started who distributed those drop boxes throughout this country, spent $300 million um, to privately change how we, how fundamentally how we vote across the country. And they're associated with Rock the Vote. So it's possible that Center for Tech, Center for Tech and Civic Life, as well as all these other um, giants, have access and share that OVR platform. And for purposes of New Mexico, $4.2 million was allocated for those drop boxes, and uh, I believe you have one here present in Otero County. Two. Two. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanted to get into now that I have that introduction, um, Alex Curtis is tied to NGOs, Brock the Vote, um, and that Center for Civic Life. He was involved in all of that stuff to give those third parties this enhanced access. Um, and one of the things I discovered through our IPRA requests um, were that Maggie and Alex sent some strange emails on Election Day. Um, so Alex is currently the Communications Director for the Secretary of State, and what that job entails is he writes press releases and he writes Facebook posts. He's not technical, theoretically, um, he probably doesn't have his hands in the data, he's not running elections, he's writing Facebook posts. So that's what makes um, what I'm about to show you um, very strange. So there were five emails sent between these people. Um, the first was at 11 a.m. on election day. I mean, sorry, 8 a.m. on 8 a.m. on election day. 11 a.m. And then there were two very close together. There was one at 3:18 p.m. And and Maggie said, "This is a just for me, just now report in that email." And then 12 minutes later, she sends what she called the official numbers. 12 minutes later, and then there was a 7 p.m. report. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So what was in those emails? Um, this is the first one that was sent. This is the 8 a.m. 820. It originates with Alex Curtis, again, Facebook post writer. But he, for some reason, is sending the Secretary of State the ballot counts for the entire state. So Otero County is in there. Um, all our counties are in there. It has the total ballot counts, and then it has all the counties broken out by their party. Okay, and then uh, he sends that to the Secretary of State, Maggie Tulos Oliver. Maggie Tulos immediately sends it to Catherine Clark. So who is Katherine Clark? If you could go to the next slide, please. I mentioned her earlier, but she is not an employee of the state. She has no business getting ballot counts, her own personal ballot counts. In fact, at the time that she was receiving these reports, she was president of Blue Suede Strategies. Um, this is her LinkedIn page. This is her own testimony of what she was doing at the time, um, where it looks like she wrote campaign plans and strategy and field plans and operations. Okay, um, she was also chair of the finance committee for the Democrat Party, so she was a Democrat official at the time. Next slide. Um, so what was in the report? So I showed you, I told you it was ballot counts for all of the counties. Um, theoretically, this is coming from the poll books. We know that they're all connected to the internet. Um, and for some reason, they're being aggregated together. And Catherine Clark, uh, you know, not a state employee, but a Democrat official and uh, candidate herself, she was on the ballot, um, is getting her own personal copies. So here's what it looks like when you graph the data that was in those poll book reports. Um, 
and you'll notice uh, most likely on election day you expect obviously people to come in throughout the day and the numbers are going to increase throughout the day and then by 7 p.m. you're going to have everybody who is going to vote on election day has voted and then you're up to 100 percent. Now you'll notice, uh, go to the next slide please, there's a couple of strange ones and I'm just going to pull out the strange ones for you. So we have two counties that lost votes on election day. Santa Fe <laughs> had 70 percent of their votes uh, cast by what is that, 11 o'clock? And then they all went away. So in the 3 o'clock, uh, 3.30 reports, there's zero ballots in Santa Fe County. Um, San Juan County lost a whole bunch of votes also. So they were near 60% cast, and then they went down to 20. And then they um, somehow magically regained those votes that were gone. Um, something, if I was the, the Santa Fe County clerk and I'm getting these personal poll book reports from the Secretary of State and I saw my county's votes go to zero, they should be saying something about that to each other. They should be, what's going on with these numbers? But there's no surprise that this is happening. So that's another odd thing. And then you have those two that were really, re really close together, just 12 minutes apart, and you can see those dots that are close together. Um, just 12 minutes um, between the, the creation of the reports. And you have <coughs> massive gains in some of these counties um, that really aren't possible that, you know, San Juan County could have had a 20% of their people vote in a 12 minute period, but that's what these poll books show. And recall that she said one was a just for her report and one was official. So I wonder what's the difference between a just for Maggie report and the official report and how you have massive increases in some of these counties in a 12 minute period. Next slide please. Okay, um, this is the absentee ballots because those public reports had all types of voting in it. So it had early voting, it had absentee, and then it had election day. So this is just looking at absentee ballots. Um, it's a little confusing. Most of the absentee ballots should have been in by election day. You don't expect, you really don't expect that 6% increase in the county on the bottom to happen. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to pull out the weird ones for you again. So you recall Santa Fe lost, ca uh, lost votes in election day. Well, they also lost absentee votes. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> and then McKinley lost a few votes. It's kind of hard to tell, but it did decrease a little bit and then it went up again. And then you've got all these other counties that had very large increases in that 12 minute period, which really probably aren't possible because most counties um, they're not, they get a mail delivery on election day and then they get all their drop boxes that come in at the end of election day, but you're not necessarily going to have, you know, a 10% increase or whatever um, in a 12 minute period in your, in your entry into the poll book. So that makes no sense. Next slide. Okay, so um, that's those poll book reports that were given you know, directly to the Democrat Party. I don't think any other candidate or party were given that, you know, preview to what was going on with the ballot counts. But this was a weird email too. It was sent a couple days after the election and Maggie was asking for the official, the final numbers of, of votes cast and Alex sends her this totally bogus list of numbers. So if you compare these numbers right here um, to the official report, that she published, they're off by tens of thousands of ballots. So he claimed that the same day voter registration um, was 11,000 people, but if you look at the, the actual data, there's 19,000 people were vote, uh, registered during early voting and election day. And then if you look at the absentee um, ballot count, he was he uh, told her there was 11,000 more than um, the official number, and then early person was 10,000 more election day uh, was was shy. So where did those votes go? It's like there's all these sets of numbers that are always changing and certain people have access to them. How, how can they be changing like this? And this affects Otero County because this is your Secretary of State doing these things and, and sending this data out outside of her office. So Alex was off by 50,000 votes. Again, what is Alex Curtis, Facebook post writer, doing with these numbers anyway? Next. So um, just to aggregate it all together for you real quick, this is too much information on one slide, but on the right, there's the 7 p.m. vote count, the ballot counts that she was emailing um, to Catherine Clark. And then on the left side, you have the official canvas. That means what she claims were the final numbers. And, and going from the 7 p.m. vote count to the official canvas is in some counties absolutely bogus. Like McKinley, um, 
gained 220% over the 7 p.m. number to the official canvas. That means somehow the poll books at the end of election day doubled the number of people that voted by the time she had given her her final numbers. How does this happen? Like you expect some change because there are mm -hmm. some trickling absentee ballots that come in at the end, the drop boxes get delivered, um, maybe everything is in entered into the poll books right at 7 p.m., but it should not be a, a hundred, you know, you shouldn't be doubling the number of voters that voted on election day, but we see that that happened. Otero's numbers were actually pretty reasonable and we talked about, you know, some of what those were and it looked reasonable from what Robin remembered happening. Um, but your Secretary of State is doing some screwy things here. Next slide. So um, we talked about that you are affected by other counties. You're affected by what your Secretary of State does. You're affected by unethical things she's doing with her ties to these people that work at these NGOs. Um, you're also affected by Doniana County. So um, this is a picture out of Doniana County. I went and I did a analysis of their all of their um, chain of custody documents for their absentee ballots. Um, and I just plotted, you know, here's what they claim came in to their office, here's what they transferred to their absentee board, and then here's what the final numbers were. So if you take what they claim came into their office, they can account for over 8,000 ballots that came into their office. They're 8,100 and something ballots off. Now, um, a friend of mine in Doniana County, um, she is very active in poll watching and, and stuff, and she went to the county warehouse one day during early voting, and she saw this box outside the county warehouse. And then she took a picture of what she saw when she peered in that little slot. This is a huge box. It probably holds, just judging by, you know, the piles of envelopes I've seen by now, this probably holds three to 5,000 absentee ballots. She peered in there, it's, it's brimming to the top with those things. This is not a drop box location. There was no uh, um, surveillance of this. This is not, I mean, this is a warehouse out in the middle of like the boonies of Doniana County. Uh, hardly anybody knows this is here, yet somehow five, you know, probably 5,000 ballots were stuffed in there and outside the chain of custody because there is no chain of custody for this particular location. So. Um, just thinking about your your Ricky Little William Madrid race that affects Otero County, um, here's 8,000 ballots. We don't know where they came from. When you transfer those, when she has her chain of custody to transfer to the absentee board, there's uh, 146. No, there was 200 that she held on to till the day after the election. 200, and there's no reason to hold on to 200 ballots to the absentee board because the farthest drive in Doniana County is probably 45 minutes away. So she had everything well be before the absentee ballot or the absentee board con um, quit for the night, um, but uh, she held on then for some reason, and it could have to do with that that race that if, that you share a district with Otero County. <laughs> and then when you look at all the um, absentee ballots that were transferred to the the canvassing or the board, the absentee board, there's 146 tacked onto that number in the official results. And so I think it's highly likely that the actions of Doniana County affected that race here in Otero County. Um, and but also those could have been provisionals that were added on at the end. And that box that was filled with those, those might have been done that way because that was all of the absentee ballots that came in and they were just put in that box to get them to the warehouse. I mean, there's different This was sitting outside a warehouse all by itself, no... Uh, no surveillance. I don't know why you would make excuses for. I'm just giving suggestions because I know different okay. Well, that we then there should be chain of custody. And that's what we're given too. But these are a little bit more factual and backed up a little bit more than just you know. I don't think there's any excuse for chain of custody not to exist for 8,000 ballots in a, in a county. Okay. Go ahead. So to, to to wrap up here because we want to be conscious of the time here is recommendations. Yes. Okay. Um, this isn't going to get any better. <coughs> it's going to continue to get worse because we're on to the cheat. We're on to it. Yeah. And, and we've tried to get ahead and partner with folks, and yet what we're being met with is obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. People that have intimidated us, submitted death threats, uh, uh, you know, running off our prime contractor, and the floodgates are opening. And there's no stopping it. 
And so my appeal to you all is, one, you've got to get rid of the machines. And to suggest that that's not possible, <laughs> Nye County, Nevada, their county commission convened, and they had election um, system vulnerability experts. I wouldn't even say that they have the qualifications of Mr. Lindbergh, but they're very qualified. And they just talked about machine vulnerabilities, and they looked at this as a matter of public trust. At the end of the day, the commission and the county clerk has to understand or, or come to the decision on do your constituents work for you or vice versa. And if, if they don't trust the system, what are you going to do with this? Are we going to have to do audits in every county? I hope not. They didn't do an audit in Nye County. They didn't do an official canvas. They did not have the information that we're sharing with you that's concrete and relevant to Otero. And it was a 5-0 unanimous vote. And now they've got a course that's charted to ensure that there's greater confidence going forward. Esmeralda County, Nevada, 3-0. Didn't have a canvas, didn't have an audit, didn't have any of this information. Based on public trust alone, they looked at machine vulnerability. They're now on course for an all-paper election. And they're going to have greater confidence in their state reps, their judicial retentions, everything else. Rio Blanca County, two to one vote. In Colorado, same thing. They're going to paper. Otero County is a miracle. So while this sounds hostile, it's because we have poured our hearts and minds into trying to restore confidence in our elections and to be a leader. Otero County is a leader. It may not feel like it right now, but you are going to be able to, to, to direct the fortunes of counties across the nation. Your people want their voices back. So there is a way to do that. I would be thrilled to introduce you all or be, perhaps have a commission delegation to talk with the steps that they've already taken to get rid of machines. There needs to be a no confidence vote and it needs to happen now. This is an emergency. Like I said, this is a crime scene. When you look at 1-5-23, unlawful destruction or alteration of data recording media, that's what we're talking about here. Your EMS has results by precinct in your elections which are capable of being used to validate voter history, which is loaded into your official voter history. <coughs> if you look at the statutory language, you have to preserve that stuff. And we're talking about an entire project file for November 3rd, 2020 that's gone. That's a violation. That's a fourth degree felony. And for, for the skeptics out there, when we get these NGOs, and we're going to get them, you need to ask yourself, is that, is that the scrutiny? Do you want to partner with us, ensure that we have law-abiding practices or not? You've got the issue of preservation of records under 1-12-69. Otero County, whether it's, your, whether it's the clerk's office or some bad actor, we're not in compliance with the law right now. We're not. The statute of limitations would have run this September, and we're finding out that this deletion happened possibly June or July of last year. No excuse for that. So I would, I would suggest uh, an ability to get you in touch with these county commissions on what they've done. And then as far as recommendations, as far as getting into an all-paper system, we can walk you through that. But right now, what's it worth to you? What's it worth to you when you sleep at night? I mean, right now you've got a packed room here that doesn't believe that their votes matter. And we're on the cusp of a primary election. And we're showing massive vulnerability after massive vulnerability. And it's going to continue. So you're going to be confronted with something in a week's time to certify a result in a primary. How are you going to do that? How are you going to be able to look your constituents in the eye and say, this is a trustworthy process, and we know for certain that our votes count, that your constituents' votes count. So uh, no confidence vote is our recommendation. Doesn't mean that you're going to have solutions on operations, and we can get into that. Maybe at your next meeting, have another emergency special session. But you need to leave this session knowing that this is an emergency. It's at your doorstep. And it's going to require that we do something quickly. And I hope that uh, the sheriff and the DA's office have been <coughs> paying attention, because this is unacceptable. It was already in the tank as far as voter trust, and now we've got an entire project file from 2020 gone. Um, 
And then if there's any other recommendations from Mr. Lindbergh on things that he'd like to, to take a look at, but you're going to have to make the decision on whether we're going to kowtow and be bullied by the Secretary of State's office on saying if you touch these machines, you're in trouble. You have concurrent jurisdiction. It's one thing for them to say that they've got the right to run their elections, but they're putting your name on the line, your name on the line on certification and administering these, these, these uh, elections. Uh, so those are some recommendations. Jeff, is there anything in specific that you would like to address? Yeah, I would just add um, that I think the mistake we've made as a country is that we've allowed our systems to be all handed over to computers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, we, as an expert, knowing what we can do with computers, we can do anything, okay? You haven't made a computer system that we can't break into, all right? Uh, nation state capabilities can break into, all right? Doesn't exist. So our, the problem we have here is this is an extremely high value target. In my opinion, the highest target for an adversary against the United States. We have an extremely vulnerable system because everything has been computerized. We, we have the registration system. Everybody's tied in. We have stuff going directly, air MVD back and forth into the system. Uh, yes, we do some checks, and I applaud the folks that do that and do it well, but not everybody does it well, okay? There's part of the problem, uh, either because they're not trained well or for other reasons. They may not do it well, but it's computerized. Then we gave our counting of votes away to machines. We computerized that. Now we're computerizing our audits, risk-limiting audits. I didn't talk about that. Give me 60 seconds. It's a sham. Risk limiting audits are a sham. They're being pushed all over the country. They're touting how they did all these risk limiting audits. They cannot work. The mathematics may work, but when you find out the actual details, it requires the ballots to be in order, in the order of the cast vote record. If you look at one of the ballot boxes, ask the ladies. When they take the ballots out, are they in the order that they were put in the tabulator? No way. It can't possibly work. You know how they get around that? Oh, well, you take another tabulator, take all those ballots, run it through another tabulator, get them all in the right order, and then check it. I, I, I mean, it's a total bogus process. They aren't checking the actual election. They just come up with a process that makes it look good. <coughs> but it's not good, okay? So they want to give it away to that. Not only that, they use a server. Uh, they use a company called Voting Works, DHS approved. Several states had it approved for the selection, okay? It's a server out in the cloud. The county, uh, all the counties log in, Secretary of State logs in, and then a computer program tells you which ones to pull out. Who's, you know, how secure is that computer in the cloud? I can tell you it's not secure. And then you look at who funded it. Guess what? The same characters. Google. Facebook, Soros Open Society funded the nonprofit that now several states have adopted to do risk limiting audits. Okay? It, it's unacceptable. The risks are just too high. We've got to take it away from the computers because it's they're just too hackable. I agree. If we want to have some, it's too important. And I uh, I appreciate you so much coming and sharing all your knowledge and, and, uh, and all the time that you've devoted to this. I can see your heart through, you know, doing it for, doing it for the sake of your country and nothing else, and we appreciate it. But, um, but I hear, I've heard everything that y'all have shared, um, you know, paper ballots. I, uh, I myself have had a position, that's the position that I've had for a long time as far as to know that we can secure, because I agree with you. 100% um, about anything that has data that's digitally stored in it in the world that we live in today I don't care if it's hooked up to the internet or not is still susceptible to hackers um, and the hackers have been proven to be out of our government's control by the mere fact that our government has paid ransoms to these hackers to not hack into our food supply and our energy sector so that is evidence in itself that hackers are operating um, outside of 
of our control um, or the law. Um, in regards to Dominion, um, Dominion's real only service is just a tabulator, correct? I mean, whenever people go to vote, they're no, signed no, up and there, registered. And There's more than that. But, 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 but Dominion, essentially for the county, we just use Dominion pretty much just to give us vote counts. No, you, you use them to actually create the ballots. So the, typically the county will send the information to the subcontractor, which in your case might be directly Dominion, it might be a third party, I don't know uh, who they send it to. But in most places that third contractor sure. is either a voting machine company or a subcontractor of the vote, voting machine company. They use their software to design the ballot. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then that from that they generate the election files, encrypted yeah. election files, and the project file with everything yeah. else on it. They give it to the county, and then county is able to burn, you know, the the election files on on onto the cards. Okay. Now, what you're pointing out here, if I can take another minute, is a huge vulnerability. People have asked, well, how in the world could they affect something all over the country? And the answer is very simple: that that software that they're using, and there's only two. Three, three, really three major companies, but two of the companies, ESNS and Dominion, have 80 percent of the votes in the U.S. Okay, so if a bad actor gets into those two <coughs> companies, somewhere or another, breaks in or becomes part of the company insider, and they modify that software, then everybody else in the system could be doing their job perfectly with high integrity, and you can subvert it so that that programming file will make that machine misbehave, right. which is what I sort of demonstrated, yeah. okay? Um, you can control that centrally. People don't understand this. Every tabulator gets a custom, every precinct, essentially every tabulator gets a custom file sent down, but it all comes from essentially two or three major sources. So if you get to that source, it flows through the entire system okay. and will affect all those tabulators. Got you. I just kind of to just kind of finish up on my thinking with it though is it's just I'm really amazed and boggled that <clears throat> again we put so much faith and trust and confidence in a machine in in the did in the digital machine that it blows my mind that whenever you fill your ballot out and you feed it into that machine that that's the last time that that ballot is looked at by human eyes, unless I'm wrong. But the last, in my little bit of research, the last time human eyes or human contact is on your ballot is whenever you feed it into the machine and from then on out, we, we trust totally in technology to give us the right answer back. And it's the most reckless way that we could be handling our politics today. Um, a county of the size of Otero with the concern that voter integrity has here in this county, we could find the volunteers very easily and put the structure together very easily to hand count the paper ballots that come in, I believe. Well, you're um, right. Thank you. And I want to affirm that in in Nye County, you're looking about uh, you're looking at a comparable population size. They're sitting there going paper and small precincts, paper and small precincts, and and for the skeptics out there, this is how we did things for over 200 years. Over 200 years, we've done this. It's not that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 all for it. Um, I'm all for anything that's going to bring um, more security to our electorate. Um, in and when this, this meeting right here started and I was contacted by um, somebody from the press and they, they asked me well, about what was going on and I said, well, we found some irregularities. And the first question that I had asked to me is, well, do you think that this is going to get more, Trump vote, tr more votes for Trump than for Biden? And I told this person, I said, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about the law being followed. And whenever you consider the law and, and, and it being followed, we can see clear evidence without a doubt that the law was broken during the election. So if the law was broken during the election, that means that our electorate was compromised. It's very simple. It's very easy. 
And so if we have a compromised election, um, at the very least, we don't let the next election be compromised and we plug the holes where this one was compromised. But, and then, but where I sat right here, I sat just like many of you, that I haven't gotten past 2020. So if there's a footprint that's still left, digitally speaking, on the 2020 election that could directly, um, you know, uh, produce d direct evidence of this fraud, if we have to look in the Dominion machines and do take whatever measures we have to take to look deeper into them, I would also be in favor of that as well. The, the country is depending on it. I mean, even, I mean, we want a resolution, I think, that, that the commissioner should pledge to have a, a formal action item on the vote of no confidence at your next meeting. It needs to happen. I would implore your constituents here to bring, not only come back, but bring as many folks. And if that means we have standing room and we've got to live stream this where people are watching on screen outside, that we show our concern to you all. But ultimately, that has to happen. And then we can talk about how to run election. But what we know right now is what's being run is not an honest election. Excuse Absolutely. me, can I, can I ask one thing um, before we do that, because we have given you guys all the ballots from 2020 that you've scanned them in, plus the digital data, plus the tapes. Do you think you'll have that done and compared so you can say, yes, there was problems or no, there were not problems? Like I said, we are still missing some ballots, so I need those well, to that, make that if determination. You're missing some, you're missing a couple of it's hundred, 200 but yeah still have the 23,000 so, to yes also. I know and I'm, I'm not going to give final answers till we have everything and I can tie it down but I can tell you right now I see problems in the data I see um, things are not random they're not random in the cast vote record they're not random in the tabulators um, they're not the drop boxes I believe were a giant problem and that's one of the reasons I showed you this um, but the whole idea was for you to compare the two. That was it. The whole happened. idea was a full forensic audit of the election. So we right. have multiple. We have multiple aspects that we're looking at. Images is one. Ballots but is I'm one. Really tapes is one. In that one for sure. Yes, I and I, I'll give you an answer. I'm just not comfortable saying it until I actually okay. have everything before I say it doesn't matter. It okay, matches. Okay, then we need to get you to come in to get you whatever we need. And to and I want to I want to reemphasize this. This is about public trust. Yeah. We don't answer to you. I'm sorry. We don't answer to you. I'm, I'm not saying you do. Yeah. But when we talk about preservation of records, right now, you don't have all your records. We do have our records. No, you don't. We don't have copies of them all. We do. Did you not hear? Did you just? No, that's not all the records. That's what the first hour of our presentation was on your entire project file missing. 2020 project no, our, file. Now, our project file, you guys can't have access to that at all. Why not? Because you can print ballots out of there. There's things you can do. That's already been determined. We're auditors. Wait, well, this isn't a state. This isn't a state. This is an approved audit. I want to know if you're, let me say one thing. Who was, who was the person responsible of letting Dominion come in and mess with our machine? Who, who called me? So what call? happens is um, at the state level, the state puts no, a committee I'm together. Let me finish. They put a committee together that bring in vendors. Vendors come to the state and they want to be part of the whole state. So they come in and there's a committee that's chosen different people from the clerk's offices all around the state. They meet, the vendors come and show them the equipment that they have. And they go through everything, they give them everything. It takes several no, meetings. Machines. They go through the machines, machines. they go and our machines. And who allowed that in our county? Well, let me finish, I haven't even gotten to that part. So once they determine who is acceptable in the whole state, then each county has the option and we had Dominion. So, so that's who we've had is Dominion. So they do our software, they do our updates, they do our updates on our machines. That's so just you, something that's so always you been done. That to Absolutely. So does that not bother you? The thirty three counties all competing at the same time? I'm not sure if that's accurate information. So watch it. I well it doesn't mean it's what, accurate. What, are, does it not concern you that that, that uh, information was lost and you were supposed to be responsible. We have it. We have it, Carrie. We have it. Do they have it? They didn't have it Mr. in that Robert. one location. What, they they want to, what, why don't you give it to them? We can't. 
Why not? I mean, I'm, I'm not going American, to prison because I'm yeah. Mr. L yeah. Let's hear from Mr. Lambert yeah. on this. Right. I have all the balance. I have all the digital data as we're required to keep for 22 months. No, you okay. don't. The yeah. project didn't have anything to do we with it. We have an investigation. Do we have to take it criminal? What do we need to do? Yeah. Uh, let's we have see. all the information we're required by law yeah. to have. One second, Robert. We're not required we to have it. I'm an American here living in Oklahoma. Well, yeah. I have a right to see it. Yeah. Oh. Well, then you need to, I guess, do an emperor through the state because we, I, they are the ones that own our machines. Okay. Yeah. Well, one second, Mr. Lin, Mr. Lin, Mr. Lindbergh, go ahead. Yeah, and in all fairness, I see both of, both of the concerns here. So, um, uh, yeah, so... Part of the problem is is the definition of what is required to be kept. Okay, so Robin says we've we've kept everything we're required to keep. Okay, um, but I think that might be disputable because it doesn't say exactly what's required to be kept. It just says you have to keep the records. So you know, are the images on the system? A record that should be there is the cast vote record per tabulator something that should be there and it's not okay the images are not that's what we have sent to Aaron we sent right. for all those you no you sent you sent a cast vote record one file someone someone put that together so that is not the the actual downloaded files the downloaded files are one per tabulator and when you load them in, they're on the machine. They are not currently on the machine. Okay, well, we'll have to look but but I car. don't think you did that. I think someone else may have done that. Well, I'll we'll have to check tomorrow. Can I, wait, I and I upload the images from the card. You download the images from the card. You get to choose whether you want to produce your results by tabulator or by frequency. So when I did it, yeah. I did it by frequency. Mm -hmm. Got them, put them on the USB, and I think I gave yeah. them to you. Yeah. She said to me, so we have yeah. everything. Yeah, but the originals, I, I understand what you're saying, but the originals should still be on the system. Even though you get to combine them and, and how you're going to process them into a report and, and so on, you get to choose that, but the originals should be on the system. Okay, and and uh, they, sh they should absolutely be there. So there's there are some things that, you know, does the law say exactly which files? I don't think so. Some people would say, well, those are part of the record. They should be there. Uh, you know, the image files, uh, they should be there. Uh, they're not there, even though there was a copy because she was good enough to export them before they disappeared. So um, so there's that's why there's a, a copy of the image files, which is good. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, th that stuff is... You know, I can see both the arguments that there's stuff that should be on there that's not on there. Whether or not, whether or not the law set, you know, how you read the law. I'm sure the Secretary of State say, no, you don't have to keep any of that stuff. But there's others that say, yeah, you ought to keep that stuff yeah. uh, that it's required. So. I think we're putting too much trust in the Secretary of State. Yeah, we are. And if I could, s yeah. when it talks about keeping election records, it says paper ballots and all digital. <laughs> records. It talks about digital equivalents of the paper ballots. I have in writing from our Secretary of State her her knowledge that multiple counties deleted their records and she does not care. So, you know, even what the black letter law states must be kept, it says okay, ballot so equivalents. I'm saying she doesn't care if it's kept or not. Oh, I'm glad. Another thing about what he's saying about the by tabulator cast vote record versus the aggregated database is that one of the things I will talk about when we present our final results is um, the manipulation in the cast vote record and how those things are put in to achieve a set point and I can prove that it is manipulated that's why it would be good to have the originals but we don't have them we do have the original back. no he's saying the original cast vote record off oh. the tabulator all that stuff has been erased well we'll, we'll find out tomorrow well, the, the, the point is this, is that this was done under, over the shoulders of county personnel just because they don't have Mr. Lenberg's um, knowledge base. And the reason why ha we have to do it that way is because the first thing that's going to be done is these folks get on the phone with the Secretary of State and they get their marching orders from law firms uh, that, that are answerable to insurance providers and looking at liability and risk instead of getting to the truth. And it's, it's shocking that people are going to die on the altar of, well, we don't have to. We don't have to 
hold on to these records. We don't have to hold on to those camp compact disc cards. We don't have to hold on to those things. They're hijacking this, and we're not just anyone. We partnered with this commission to do a full forensic audit, and we're getting treated like trespassers. We work for you in the sense that you have authorized us to do all of these things. Right. And we're still being held at arm's length <clears throat> and being threatened with criminal investigation. And so when I first addressed this commission, I said, this is not about the law. This is not about anything because the evidence is overwhelming. And we can do this for days if you wanted to. This is about courage. Mm -hmm. That's all it comes down to is do you all have the same courage as, as, the, as the stuff that we're demonstrating? Please do not wait. Please get this on your agenda as an action item. And don't put yourself in the position to, to certify this mess. Because I can guarantee you this, we're not going away. We'll be, we'll be back here every two weeks until we die, if necessary, to get this straightened out. In what sense, Kerry? Um, I, uh, my job here is to, to tell the commissioners what the law is written and what sure. um, action will come from what decision they make. And um, <clears throat> as far as the machines, the state law mandates we use the machines. Um, the clerk, her opinion is that they will use the machines. There's federal law that at least one machine will be at each precinct uh, to meet ADA standards. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's where David mentioned courage just a minute ago, and it's going to take, it, what it takes is it takes your local officials, including us and our county sheriff, just to honor our oath to office. If we, if we honor our oath to office, we, we've been presented with the facts that, that, the, that, that there's big reason for concern. So, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I... May, may I mention one thing? When we looked at the proceedings in the past, and we went back to your commission meeting after the November 3rd, 2020 election, first I want to commend you for not agreeing to certify it, Commissioner Griffin, from the outset. But what was told, because we knew that there was something wrong then, we could have done something a, over a year ago. We wouldn't be in this mess right now if we didn't kick the ball down the road. You're right. And you all were given instructions under coercion that if you didn't vote, they were going to get the Supreme Court to issue a writ of mandamus and, and, and do it on your behalf. That's not representation. And that's on the record. We've reviewed that. And so right now, what they're telling you is that you really don't have the constitutional authority to uphold your oath to certify something that's worthy of certification. They'll say, hey, if you don't want to do it, We'll get rid of these machines. We'll place some new ones. They're going to wait on the next slate of, uh, of candidates that will likely be selected, not elected. And they're going to want this problem to go away with a new commission. You can't kick this can down the road. And I hate to be this blunt, Commissioner. And this is to uh, my brother in Christ here, Commissioner Griffin. He put it on the line a long time ago. And he was in a jail cell for three weeks for praying outside the Capitol building. And he's got sentencing coming up on June 11th. The same people that have compromised our system that are going around intimidating people, canceling people, leaving death threats, writing false articles, and manufacturing investigations from Congress. Time is ticking. We've got patriots here, but we're not going to be here forever because they're picking us off one by one. Yeah. Absolutely. I sign up to, to talk, but I, I have to. Yes, sir. Shouldn't it bother every one of us that the people that are fighting us the hardest are probably the people that are guilty of what? Absolutely. Yeah. Shouldn't that not bother us at all? You're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, Mr. Rich. Director, may I speak up? On behalf of this county who is full of veterans, full of veterans who have either bled for our country have died for our country, yes. are buried in Monte Vista Cemetery right here in Alamogordo on behalf of those people who gave every one of us here our freedoms. Amen. From the day of the Minuteman 
to the soldier who's still deployed and fighting overseas yeah, yeah. and given us our freedom from day one. Yep. Don't do those men wrong. They fled, they died on everybody's behalf. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. I have one gentleman that signed up, uh, Matt. Is he still here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not going to take a whole bunch of time because there's been a long thing and a lot to do, uh, repeat here. I just want to touch base on a few things. I'm going to turn this up. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the uh, talking about the... Um, Matt, you can go to the microphone. Okay. You should be able to go to the microphone. Well, they need to move their stuff. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> the 2,000 mules. Um, first of all, the data that is in that propaganda film is completely inaccurate. Okay, uh, we don't first, need to on, debate on, that. Hold on, I'm allowed to speak. If you want to run to the bathroom like sure. last time, Mr. Griffin, you no, can. No, uh, yeah, I'd rather. So, <laughs> so <laughs> the, speaking, of, I'll, I'll talk on the cell phone data. It's something I've worked with myself in law enforcement and military. The data that, that you guys are, comp are using there is not accurate enough to determine any of the information you're using. That wasn't the basis of this presentation. Okay, that was mentioned quite a bit in this presentation. But so yes, it is. You go to a lot of those um, <clears throat> Actually, I have a tape of you refuting. When exactly and which copy of voter rolls do you have and where did you get them? Are you going to address the commission, or what do you? Well, yeah, well, you're not going to ask questions, right? We got them through a le legally permissible channel. The reason why we don't end up identify the source is because you all, people like you, dox people, yeah. and they end up getting threatened. So I'm not going to give there up the no, source. There was no doxing. Yes, there was. No, there that was, certainly that was. was. Yes, there was. Okay, the doxing. The, the doxing yes, he's talking was. about. She was doxed. Yeah, she was, was doxed. A copy of an email that was sent between an RB and other folks. That is public record because it's official. Sir, your stuff. actions have so threatened my family. I don't have. I don't have to identify anyone. Anyway. Yes, they have. They Point did. of order: Somebody has the floor, right? He was asking us a question. Now. I asked you a question. You either answer the yes. question fully or stop. And I've answered the question. I've answered no, the question. You didn't tell me where you got them from. Because you want to identify and dox that person, no, I won't do no. that. That's not boxing. That's, that should be public. Unless information. you've got suspicion of crime, you're not entitled oh, to know who I don't have. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. How many agencies are right now? How many, how many agencies have contacted you, David? You know, it depends. Because Maggie Tolu's Oliver's brother filed a mm -hmm. complaint against me for political reprisal because I've been talking about this to get to the truth. It's it's weaponized politics. And okay. you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Ashamed. Uh, yeah, let, let's, let's stay on. Politics. How do you consider a threat if, they're, if the officials are warning you not to commit a crime? That's not a threat. They're saying, hey, this is a criminal act. It's under New Mexico state law. And they're telling you not to do it. That's not a threat. So when we, pay, when we play the voice messages at the, at the last meeting that you were here, when someone's threatened to blow our effing heads off. And none of that was connected to that video specifically. And none of that was run down by Well, it's my life, so excuse me if I fool the day. Those, those, those were Thank you, Matt. Can be made up. Please. I'm just responding to what he okay. said. Okay. If you're asking a question, call me on. You can ask us. You know, I get into Mr. Clements' personal life. Anything of that? I'm not getting into an argument. We're not going to get into an argument match here. If I'm you have something to say, you state it. Please state it and be done with it, please. But I'm not getting an argument, Jerry. Okay, well, we'll just do what he says. Just have to speak to one thing. Let's see where else. Oh. Let me see if I can find that video real quick. I'll play the audio so everyone can hear. Questions, not presentation. What is this? Well, I'm allowed to speak, right? Well, right. not a video. What is the video of? This is, this is a video of Aaron admitting that the uh, tapes or the uh, roster she's using is out of date. It's from 2021. <laughs> so it's before the voter rolls were being purged. So the data you were using for the campus was completely... No, added. you have no idea what you're talking about, yes, Matt. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just blew the whole lid off of it, Matt. <laughs> so exactly which list you have was the other I have said, I ha I was on those graphs, if you were paying attention, you would see it ends at July 2021, and I've said that nothing different since then. Okay, which was before the purge. When do you, the purge occurs right after the election. If you look at my other graphs, you'll know that. But where is the validation of your graph? 
Could you not manipulate that information? Why would I manipulate that information? People manipulate. We're, we're, we're not Dominion. We're not Dominion. You're using everyone else to manipulate. We're not Dominion. So how do we know? Hold on. Lots of good questions. How can, you, how can you sit there and say, why would we do it, yet accuse somebody else of doing it, right? If they have a motivation for doing it, you may have a motivation. You know how, how much fun it is to sit here and have to look at people like you, talk to me the way you are, accusing me of manipulating data. This is not fun at all. No one would choose this. No one would choose this. Um, thank you. But how can you sit there and say it's wrong to be accused, but it's fine to accuse others? Except for we bring evidence. You didn't bring any valid evidence. Okay, well, I'll take, we'll pull them. So can I have a copy of everything you presented tonight so next week I can present... I would get arrested if I did that because um, you can't just put that stuff out. But if you got it through a legal means, you could graph it yourself and see for yourself. to the council a play-by-play, because I can show all that stuff. Matt, we present publicly to the public. I will not give you the person that's doxed my family and has been the cause of death threats, anything, because you're not entitled to it. But this county commission is, and this public is. No. Uh, the, 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 the midnight calls where someone says they're going to kill my wife, and, and, it, and it gets out because of people like you. That's why. No, I'm just not stupid. I'm not going to introduce a, a security threat, Matt. But why can't I have it so I have access to it? Thank you. So, so no, I'm not good. That's all. All right, Dave, you have anything to close out? No, I just pray that you, you stand with your constituents. And uh, there's a difference between having one unhinged operative versus the will of your constituents that care about their vote. This is not about partisan issues. This is about Democrats and Republicans. The last time I checked, Otero County is red through and through. If this was a partisan issue, this would be the last county we would do an audit. If this was about threatening the Republicans, all right? So we're doing this because this actually could affect Republicans. Absolutely. It's, it, there's no guarantee. This is about honesty. This is about what I my opened with my statement is about the Lord abhors inaccurate weights and measures. He's disgusted by them. And we've got machines that slice, shuffle, flip, and the, the vulnerabilities are just sickening. And the question that I want to just ask everyone is, we don't have to do it this way. Like we're fighting this, this battle when we don't have to do it this way. And so we're asking for you all to serve your constituents in restoring voter trust. And this is not going to be restored by being bullied and by being intimidated. It won't happen. It's going to be the exact opposite. So we need your help. Thank you, Commissioner Matherly. Thank you, Commissioner Griffin. And thank you, Commissioner uh, uh, Marquant, who is, I believe, still on the line. Absolutely. I am still on the line, and I'd like to speak. Okay. Go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh, yes, just speak as loud as you can on the phone, Vic. Or just speak up. Is this better? Yeah, that's better. OK. All right, first I'd like to say a big thank you to all the volunteers that are there tonight and that went selfishly door to door, donated their time, and then put up with all the crap they've had to put up with since the Secretary of State put all the negative vitriol that she put online. It's pretty sad when we've got people that actually give a damn about our vote and will put their time, their sweat into it give up their Saturdays to go out there and go door to door and then to have to have this kind of push back from our state is, is a sad day. And I've heard probably two or three hundred emails from all over this country of people supporting what we're doing and they're telling me, almost every one of them, I wish my county commission had the nerve to do this because we think something's wrong in our county too. So there's a lot more of us out there than, than you think. And so everybody take heart. I think that we're on the right track. And I think everyone there that cares enough to come out and, you know, be down there at 830 at night. And I wish I could be there in person, but I'm up in Colorado helping one of my kids that's six and a half surgery. But um, I just want you guys to know that I'm, I'm there with you, and I, I'm praying for you, and I just thank you all for, for everything that you're doing. So thank you. Th thank you so much. 
Thank, thank you so much, Vicky, and we we miss you here. And uh, but thank God for technology that you can dial in and and stay up with everything that's going on. But um, but we'll be praying for your situation up there, Vicky, and be safe. And we'll look forward to seeing you when you get back. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. David, like I said, the last time we met, the most important thing that I have is to be able to trust in what we have left. Voting is our last thing we have. Uh, and that, that's where I feel uh, I want people to have the trust. I I want to be able to trust that my vote, my write it down, is what it is. So I don't, we have to figure it out. Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Amy Barella. Um, and I believe 2010, when I first got my feet wet in this process, um, there was a lawsuit filed with a village uh, candidate for council. And that lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court until we could not, they not, could not fund it anymore, the lawsuit. And that was based on absentee ballots that changed the results of election. Now, that was not under the county at the time, that was under Tularosa. Then again in 2016, the same thing happened. The village clerk was not found for up to an hour after the polls closed. And when she did show up, she had an armful of absentee ballots, and it changed the results after they added it, not one of those ballots going for the Republican candidate for council. Then, in uh, 2018, we all know what happened in Las Cruces with absentee yeah. ballots. Okay, and that is really when I started getting heavily involved in and trying to figure out election integrity and everything. Here in, uh, in Otero County, absentee ballots changed the results of election for Ricky Little. And in 2021, just last year, it would change the results of election for the school board in Tula Rosa. And I was there for her after that meeting, after the canvassing of 2021 election, and went over there. And I know for a fact that, that our clerk's office balanced perfectly. The problem was, the upload to the Secretary of State was eight ballots off, eight ballots off, which changed the results of the election for that school board candidate. So uh, I, again, I don't blame this office because I sat there and went over those takes with her and we tallied them and it was correct. It was Secretary of State and that was in the transition of upload or whatever. So ghost voters I wanna to touch on. I have not been able to find a ghost voter that has actually voted. Um, ghost voters, I think, are used for the manipulation of people that follow stats. So they register to vote, and they use, you know how criminals get caught, they use common um, date of birth, like January 1, 1950, January uh, 1, 1960, and all that, and they create, you know, throwing out the data, like I say, because these ghost voters don't vote, but they donate five dollar contribution contributions nationwide to no specific party or candidates. I think it's just a throw that. Um, in February, the Republican Party of New Mexico held a pre-primary convention. If anybody knows that, that's the very beginning process of the election. We vote for the last couple of years. We used a, a digital voting platform. And uh, I was very confident with that platform. And we were having problems getting the email addresses, which they used to vote off of, into the system and with duplicate voters. And so we couldn't clean it up, couldn't clean it up, and this was extending our election. And I was adamant, we can fix this because as soon as we get it fixed, People can vote, and we'll be done. The, the election process will be done. We'll show the results, and we can all go home. Well, we couldn't fix it. We were trying to eliminate the data, and I mean, elim eliminate the duplicates, and it couldn't be done until uh, Steve here says, we're going paper ballot. So we went paper ballot. And I can tell you with 100% confidence that that paper ballot is absolutely accurate, no errors, and double check. And we can walk away from that primary convention knowing it was completely correct. Yeah. Yeah. So now we talk about, you know, getting on the agenda about paper ballots for Ontario County. So the only thing that I question doing that, 
and you, I understand you have the, the software to be able to print your own ballots. How do we ensure that we don't print extra ballots? And, and how can we make sure that this paper ballot system is just as secure as what they're going to claim the machines are? speak to that. Uh, that's the topic that I did not address tonight, but I know quite a bit about it. It is another huge vulnerability on everybody's system, including, including Otero's uh, in, in uh, Georgia, in, in Michigan, in Arizona. When they generate the, uh, the project files, uh, in there are the PDFs for the ballots unencrypted. So the election files to program the machines are encrypted, but the ballots are not. So sitting on your machine uh, are typically the ballots in a PDF format. And that's true all over the country. Uh, there were people running around Michigan that had the entire state's worth of PDF ballots on a USB stick. And the problem is with today's technology, I wrote a report on this up there, call it, called it ballot magic, I believe. But we demonstrated we can make ballots ourselves for 300 bucks. We can make uh, hundreds a day uh, by hand. Uh, for 300 bucks, we can, for a few thousand dollars, we can make thousands per day that look perfect and pay a little bit more and go to a printer that wants to cooperate and you can make tens of thousands of day of ballots. And there's, these machines do not care. They look perfectly correct. And so there's no ballot chain of custody almost in the entire country. Now there are ways to do it where there is a chain of custody. I found a county down in Georgia where they printed it with a, they printed ballot pads with a tear off number on it. And those were completely accounted for. So when they gave those to someone at a precinct to be used for voting, they had to account for every ballot. And at the end of the, the day, the ballots had to come back that were left over. And it was all accounted for. So everybody knew the ballots. With the system we're using now, where ballots are printed on demand, can't do it. Again, we computerized it. You just go anywhere you want, and then we'll print your ballot for you. Okay? No, but we balance out every night, too. Yeah, but what I'm saying is it's trivial r right now for anybody to go out, and all you got to do is get access to, to that PDF file or that set of PDF files, and you can make tens of thousands of ballots. If you have a cooperating printer, and we went to one in Michigan, and we printed thousands of, of ballots uh, up there. They have no problem doing that for you. Uh, and you can print them pre-voted. So we didn't print black blank ballots, we printed voted ballots, okay? Voted a certain way uh, for our testing purposes. So that's a huge, huge problem is, is the ballots and what are you gonna do about it? Because there's no chain of custody on ballots in most of the country right now and that's gotta be fixed. We can't have ballots just showing up willy-nilly everywhere. Yeah, but then you can't do ballot on demand, right? Uh, because now it's a paper ballot. You have to generate, you know, have printed stocks, and people are going to have to show up <coughs> and, and get the right precinct. And that means you're probably not going to allow people to just vote anywhere they want. They're going to have to go to the right place to vote to get the right ballot. But once they are printed a ballot and it's under their name, then they can't vote again. Mm -hmm. They're given a permit sheet, the ballot, so this ballot on demand system at the end of the day prints out the number of ballots it's printed out. Then they put it through the tabulator. The tabulator prints out the number of ballots that were taken in. And then we have the uh, permit sheets that are counted. All three of those things have to match. Right. So somebody can't bring in a bunch of ballots. Plus we have boards there that are half Democrat, half Republican. They're all watching. We have watchers that are watching yeah. everybody yeah. do things. So if in our our VCCs, everything's balanced. So there's no way, even yeah. if they were pretty balanced. Yeah. So so you're you're correct as far as you know the part that you can watch. But if you go to the part where ballots are just showing up in ballot boxes or you know it absent be in an envelope with a yeah. barcode on it for yeah. us yeah. to scan in right. to accept them. Right. It's happening. I mean, there's four million minutes of document proof video evidence. But by not Otero County or yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're not suggesting Otero County. We're just saying, yeah. Well, it's not preserved, even though the statute says it's an election record. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that we know is going on in Nye County is Nye County has taken this route. Um, 
to to go a paper ballot route. So, I mean, I've always, you know, why, why reinvent the wheel? I'm sure they've already got the process. I'm sure they there's there's great ideas out there um, that we can all entertain and find the best idea that fits for Otero County to make sure that, just like Gerald said, you know, I mean, I I'm I'm just in step with him. I mean, we all we want is to make sure that everything is on the up and the law hasn't been broken and unfortunately um, the way i see it right now for dominion is that they've broken the law by not storing the the data that they were supposed to have legally on file so um i have a problem with that but um i think what we probably ought to do is find another day um in the very near future as soon as we can that works for everybody um i know that vicky's uh, we need to make sure it works for Vicky too, because I know how important this issue is for Vicky. Um, so when it works for Vicky and y'all, um, I'd say we call another special meeting, and on the next agenda we'll have some action items, and um, we'll have some things that we can vote on. So, um, yeah, I mean, I that that's kind of where I rest on it, anyhow. Okay. Thank you. Well, the key thing to keep rolling through my mind is tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Early voting starts. I know. Yeah, I know. That's the problem. <coughs> I wouldn't do it. Recommendations. Is it going to start? Well, let's start with what won't work right now. It's what's not working right now. And and so the the temptation is we've just thrown a grenade into the process that this is not the most safe and secure election. This is the most vulnerable gut-wrenching, illegal, criminal, treasonous election in history. That's where we're at. And we're worried about going through the motions. My problem with that is it's similar to what you confronted just after November 3rd, 2020. It's this beast that, sh that it, it comes down to courage. But you don't cover up bad with more bad. This is going to have to come down to, we've got a problem, it's triage. Let's stop the bleeding. If we can just agree on that, let's stop the bleeding and then let's collect ourselves on the path forward. Um, but the resolution, the vote of confidence, just by saying it out loud with the United County Commission will change the trajectory of this country because many people are looking to Otero for leadership. Because you all are one of the few folks that have actually demonstrated having a spine. I mean, we're proud of you. We're proud of you for that. But we have to stop the bleeding. As far as practical applications, maybe on the next uh, meeting session, that's why I'm recommending that you all consult with Nye County. There's a path forward, and there's things that we can do even with the existing architecture to minimize fraud that we would be happy to recommend. I just don't know if that's going to be tonight. Commissioner Matherly, um, as far as Nye County goes, they're proceeding with their primary with uh, machines still because it was logistically impossible to switch over to uh, hand count. Um, before the primary started so they're looking at what they're going to do for the general election uh, as far as ha hand counts go get through the prime get through the primaries and then they're um, working with their clerk to see what is feasible how they can make it work also one thing to keep in mind that you know when we begin voting we will have our ballots if at some point we want to do an audit after this election the primary election we still have all of our paper ballots. Can and you, as it's closer to when the election's been at that point, then you can have audits. When you did this audit for 2020, which it was an hour, a year and a half after the election, there were no provisions in the election code to do any kind of audits or hand tallying. But after this election, if you get it close enough after the election, the results come out, then at that point you can do that. Right, right right now there is uh, you guys can get rid of the drop boxes right now uh, the, I mean that's that's one yeah. fix to where you can you can start minimizing vulnerability very least so I mean there's ways again triage to, to eliminate risk we get rid of the drop boxes immediately but the vote the commitment to going and addressing all the vulnerabilities can still take place just like Nye County uh, logistically, we realize that it's going to be impossible to run a paper election in the next two weeks. We get that. But but the vote and speaking that into existence is huge. 
and it's going to honor the work of your community. That's that's what we're looking to see. Who has the power to require IDs for votes? Who has the power to require right, I voter want to ID? I want a paper ballot and show my ID and somebody care. Yeah. We, we, so we, I want to at least feel like I've done everything <clears throat> I can do to make my vote count. And I believe because that we have... Closing that damn machine yes, afterwards. Sir. Nobody's looking at it again. I believe that we have we if if we wanted to impose a voter ID, um, I believe that we could, couldn't we? I mean, we, as far as the law goes, you you can you can strengthen it. No. Right. Well, but, they claimed that during COVID, you could do whatever you wanted in above and beyond what the state required. Exactly. But I don't only, know why only, you only if it punishes ID. us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if it helps us, then you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> Once we opted in to align our elections, the municipal elections and, and all of that, then we're not allowed to not align with the Secretary of State. So we have to opt out. We're ready of, to opt out. Of the municipal elections. That's just that's not for federal elections. That's only for school elections or municipal elections. But it would change the authority of the commission, is what I'm saying. So if it was an opt-out situation, then the commission would have the authority to say, well, the city, right. the city would, the city would, because it would be, it's under a city charter. Okay. They would have to pass the charter that said they're requiring ID. That's how that would work. Yes, sir. There are many counties that are still counting votes by hand. So going with machines are not mandatory. Um, this guy globally, and as far as the integrity, we all want the integrity of a personal ID. Just make it happen. Yeah. No. Why, why are we letting someone at the federal level? Yeah. Can we yeah. I agree. I agree. And again, isn't it convenient that the one person who's the most guilty in this state is in charge of yeah. how we vote? Right. Yeah. Right. Why can't we take existing ballots and hand count them? Right. Yeah. They have. They scanned them. They have them. They have them. That's what we're waiting on to no, see. No, I'm saying hand count them. Hand count them. They can do whatever they want with those. She's talking about the primary uh, election, I believe. Oh. Oh, after the election. No, we, no, 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 no. I'm talking about during. if we fill out the, the ballot, hand count them. It doesn't go through the machine, period. Well, Good. we have processes at this point, like he was just saying with the other county. The process is broken. <laughs> but you, you have hand tally procedures. It is what it is. But from what I understand from what David said, if we touch the machines, they get uh, they get uh, decommissioned. So by golly, let's go touch the machines. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Fighting for your vote, you get to go to jail. I just want to make a couple of points here. First of all, I want to thank all the volunteers help all this, the, the Clements, Mr. Lindbergh, and all the auditor, uh, the canvassers. Uh, the second thing is that uh, you guys, as public servants, deserve a real round of applause Thank because you. you guys were, are trying to work for us, we the people. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And the state and the federal government have it backwards. Right. We dictate what needs to be done. Try it. They, you guys are listening. You guys have a special meeting. You guys are really, have a lot on your plate. Last week, what, you guys met three times? You guys have been doing amazing, and we appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The last thing I want to say, as far as all the elections, you guys ever see kids try to practice magic act with the cards? Yeah. And being a magician, and they fumble all over. Oh, I got the wrong card right. You know, they're not, they're not good. But you get somebody like David Copperfield. They're good magicians. It looks really good. How did he cut those guys, that lady's legs off? How do you do that? That's a that's amazing. That's the whole point of a magic act to make it appear one way, and it's actually some other way. That's what the elections are now. It's a big magic act. Most people are fooled. Well, 
lot of people, but some people, uh, counting, you know, the people, government officials are fooled. Believe in the magic act. And it's not true. It's fantasy land. Yeah. We want the truth. We yeah. don't want that yeah. mask taken off. We want to pull that blanket off that lady and see, oh, her legs are still attached. That's what we want. And we appreciate what you guys are doing, mm -hmm. trying Thank to expose you. that. And the Clements here, trying to expose Absolutely. the magic act. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I, we, we brought some stuff to attention tonight. Appreciate that. Appreciate what y'all got to do. Appreciate what y'all do over here. But uh, we have we have elections in process, right? We're, we're getting ready to go to elections. And I, I, just sitting here listening, we've been addressed with potentially criminal stuff. Fraud, felony divorce <coughs> case, very big discrepancies that we can't answer right now. And I'm looking at these candidates around here, and they're putting time, effort, and money into what they're doing yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're looking at it going, "Well, I'm walking into another problem here, right. and we've all been exposed to it tonight. And it's not by happen chance that this election is coming. And every one of them have got." dollars, cents, and their lives putting out on this thing. Yep. So our decision right now is not just whether we do this. We're, we got potential problems with these folks knowing that we all, including our county attorney, are all aware of some illegalities here that's going to put their election in a pinch. True. Yeah. So we have to make some type of a move here to it. To address that situation, Amen. Amen. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. No, I believe that. You know, I I agree 100 percent with you, Roger. I I mean, we're we're consciously bound now. Um, consciously, I guess. I mean, you know, I mean, once the truth is revealed, now you have, uh, you know, now you have to respond to it, and uh, and so we're we're going to have some we'll have some decisions that we're going to need to make. All right. Does anybody have anything else? I have one quick comment. We're not trying to take votes away from the left. We want their votes to count, too. Sure, absolutely. We want our votes to count, too. We don't want to go to bed at night knowing that we went to all this trouble. We're law-abiding citizens, and now we're being stamped on, we're being trampled on, we're being taken advantage of. If there's nothing to hide, then what's the big deal? Uh, right. Just do a paper right. ballot with, right. with a driver's license. You bet. That's right. One of the slogan differences is every vote counts versus every legal vote counts. Yeah. And that's the big one. We want every legal vote to count. Amen. David. Is there any plan to uh, bring this evidence that you presented tonight um, to the district attorney? I know you you know Scott well. Um, uh, either going with the sheriff to get a search warrant so that we could maybe search the computers, search the machines. Sure. Um, my my position is that your county sheriff is your supreme law enforcement in the jurisdiction. And when he sees evidence of a crime, he needs to investigate it. That doesn't mean that we're looking at trial. It doesn't mean that he's going to determine how you do your elections. But from a standpoint of recognizing election code, where you've got probable cause that a crime's been committed, it affords the ability to do warrants. Um, I believe that Scott Key will evaluate whatever's submitted by the sheriff's office. Um, I will be happy to advise on what I think the relevant codes are uh, to do that. Um, and I hope that they do. I really do. Um, because what we're seeing here is the, one of the only possible ways of securing this in light of the fact that evidence has been removed is to get this out of the hands. Because Dominion plays dirty. Mm -hmm. Dominion likes to sue people. Dominion likes to file lawsuits against people to shut them up. And they've done that across the country. And so right now, if I'm the bad guy, I want an injunction. I want a lawsuit. And I, once again, it's not going to instill public trust. But your, your criminal investigators, your law enforcement, aren't subject to that civil law lawsuit. they got to do their job, and I hope that they will. Absolutely. Um, since the data's been turned over to the county, I'm making an official request as of right now to have that data within 48 hours so I can review it. Is that a reasonable amount of time? Since it's 
Okay. Which data? All the data that they've used to present to you guys today. Because it's oh. public record now. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can I answer that real quick, Matt? Matt, right? So what I hear you and you saying is that my graphs are so damning and you admit it that you must um, accuse me of manipulating it no, to make it look that it. way. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, is it, so Matt, Matt wants to audit us, but he won't let us do the commission audit here. That's that's very funny. <laughs> Matt, Matt, we'll let you audit us, but just let us do our audit first. It's all on Rumble. It's all on Rumble, Matt. We live streamed the whole thing. It's on YouTube. Any report that they present to you, I would like copies of from this evening and prior. I know there was a meeting with Robin and her team. Uh, it's online, Matt. It's online. I've shared the link. I don't know a million times. You can have all this stuff. I'm going to get it. In special records request. Thank you very much, Aaron. All right. Um, but we're not. We're not public agencies, though, Matt. I, I didn't say you were. <laughs> Give it to the county. The Good county luck. has that information, and I can, as a citizen, can request it through the Freedom of Information Act or the Records Act. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'll talk about that. Matt, we're doing the Emperor. Doing the Emperor. And it'll be taken care of. Okay? You have to apply for the request the right way, and it'll be taken care of. All right. If there's no, nothing else, anybody else? We'll yeah, Dara, go ahead. So when this all started, you said that you couldn't take a vote tonight. Yeah. It's not. <coughs> we just didn't have an action item on this agenda. We just, we were just going to, we scheduled this meeting just to accomplish exactly what was accomplished here right, this evening. So, so can you decide tonight when you can make it an action item and could it be tomorrow or does it have to wait until Thursday? It, it have to be 72 hours. It's got to be 72 hours for pub, for for yeah. the next spe special meeting. So, um, yeah, I mean, let's check. Let us check with Vicky and uh, make sure that and and let us and we'll and we'll get something on. We'll get something going soon. We're gonna need to get some information together with the attorney. I'm sure Vicky's got a thousand questions. So. We're going to have to have a little bit of time to get this put together. But it'll be as fast as we can get it put together. We'll, 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 this is this is the hottest, This is for me, this is the hottest thing that I have on my plate. Do you have the ability to move it to a bigger venue like the Civic Center? Absolutely. We can. Oh no! When, when we schedule the next meeting, we're going to have it. We'll have it in a much larger venue, and we'll encourage each one of you to bring a friend. So <laughs> we'll we'll pack we'll pack it somewhere. Absolutely. All right, that's it. Yeah. Well, I just I I want to once again thank everybody tremendously. Thank you so much for your for your service, and David and Aaron. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I know that I know that Mike and Kendra, y'all made the trip down, um, and uh, kind of as a as a call out. And uh, if you want to have an opportunity to say anything, then um, um, kind of about some of your struggle going on. Well, yeah, probably we it'll it'll probably have to be. Um,
who like to go to our mountain, who we like to be there, we're, we're all concerned. Um, yeah. it, it's imminent right now because our, we're one of the only forests in New Mexico that's not on fire right now. <laughs> so yeah. even if we had a spark catch, all of our resources are up north right now and everywhere else fighting the fires that are already going. Yeah. So, um, and, and it worries me that they, that I'm, I hate to place blame, but the Forest Service started the fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and, yes. And, and, he did. And it scares me because wind, I hate wind. And I, wow. I mean, there but by the grace of God go I. Yes. I mean, it could well, happen and to and any it's all, it's, uh, There's a lot of homes down that canyon. We had the same exact canyon in 20. 2002, 2002, and the, the same well, it, and it was a welder <laughs> in the same exact canyon, wow. and he said it in the poor man committed suicide. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know really where we can go with that. We need a lot of support. When, it, when uh, is your meeting with that? Well, we're, we're, trying yeah. to, we're, we're, yeah. just, we're here for that. We have yeah. the chair of Black yeah. has shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. Done a lot. Coy has helped us a whole lot. So yeah. we, we got to get the word out. Well, yeah, it's, it, go ahead. Today is precedence um, in Tularosa on Orcs Trail. A gentleman that was welding started a fire. I don't know if you're listening to that. And I think it was almost a structure fire, but when the grass fire put out, okay. and it was the sheriff's office that said, you are not allowed to use a welder right now. Yes. So yes. precedence has been set as of today. And our sheriff was up there. I mean, and he's had deputies. He's trying as hard as he can. But he needs all the support that we can possibly give him. Um, but didn't they right there on the exemption? They did. Yes. That was yes. good of them. Oh, yes. Sheriff sure Black can probably address that. Uh, we just needed a lot of support. Yeah. Right. And he needs support. Sheriff Black needs support. And uh, I, yeah, da David and I were in touch today. David went up and looked around and assessed the situation. He's got his deputies keeping a good eye on it. But, um, but again, it's just uh, it, it's just so unbelievable that the United States Forest Service will, will do this to us because the restrictions that the fire restrictions right now are as high as they've ever been, and they should be. We're we're in a drought right now, yeah. like uh, that's unprecedented. We we've, we've got a drought right now that we've never seen. We have a forest that is an abs. It, it almost just looks like it's going to self combust at any time. And you have the United States Forest Service running a welder right in the middle of the right in the middle of our forest. I went up to northern New Mexico on Friday to go help my friend. Yeah. It, it's devastating. Oh, I know. And it could happen to us. Yes, sir. Not only the welding, we here a couple of weeks ago had they were cleaning up the James Canyon Cemetery. They were mowing and weed eating. We got a little fire started that way. Pure innocence. I'm not knocking them. The people that come up there and was doing that was doing a, a great job. It just got a spark and, and we got a fire. So even the weed eaters, the mowers, uh, another thing, people going down the road and have a flat tire and they'll spread fire down the canyons like crazy. So this kind of needs to get out. And, and yeah, and as Kendra said, you know, I mean, we're, we're so exhausted on the state level as far as our firefighters go with all these big fires going that if we were to get something going, God forbid, here in Otero County, um, we'd really have to compete for the support to, to help us out. So um, I think that, you know, I mean, um, with David and I's conversation earlier, I think that we can all stand very strongly together that you know, we're going to stand adamantly against anything that creates a spark or, or especially a welder up there on the mountain. Yeah. Go ahead, David. One more thing. Yes, sir. Don't, don't look at my overtime budget. <laughs> 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 the Forest Service has one LEO for Otero uh, uh, and Lincoln County. Wow. One law enforcement officer. Weekends you get tampered and stuff like that up there. They're building fires. Yeah. Um, um, well, I'm going to look at trying to do some overtime, get some of my guys up there, and do some patrols and stuff. Um, yeah. Well, you just, wouldn't think you'd have to patrol this forest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if, if, if we don't, who's going to? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, just give me a so is Absolutely. Is it evidence that we have to do this right now? Yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of this. Yes, sir. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. 
Mr. Davis, I understand that, uh, like I'm, I'm in the mouth of Rush Canyon. A lot of people in there camping, building campfires. We, the fire departments and or people living there, cannot actually ask the people to put the fire out. We've got to wait for a law enforcement from the Forest Service. Really? Yeah, I mean, is that right? I mean, we'll, we'll go help you with that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not scared. Hey, you got a fire truck. I'll hold the hose. <laughs> I don't know how the majority of the people feel, but in the mountains we feel that there's been a, an overstep of the federal government yeah, in our area. Oh, yeah. And I want to I want to bring to your attention this: in Otero County, if we're ever going to back them up to where they need to be, now is the prime time because okay. they've overreached with the fire in the north. They've overreached yeah. with Rudolph, so now they're overreaching on us. So I want to bring that to your attention. If you're sick and tired of that, now is our chance yeah. to fight back. I agree. <laughs> back them up and make them stand. Is there, is there any way you could deputize people? <laughs> and supply her with a gun. Give her a gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we better adjourn, <laughs> Gerald. You better adjourn before we get. Meetings <laughs> adjourned. <laughs>